Uh, I love that he made that, that uh, caveat that you don't have to write your name on the questions about sexual brokenness. I think that that's helpful because, you know, I do this around the country all over the place, and, and I think that people sometimes are a little afraid to ask those questions or be exposed about them. But, um, yeah, don't feel the need to write your name on the questions. I'm kind of joking, so I hope we can laugh a little bit about that. Yeah? No? Okay. Um, well, I'm going to share my testimony this morning, um, and I want you to know that as I share, I'm, I am going to share some, some very, I mean, they're heavy things, and they're difficult things that, generally speaking, in most churches, we don't talk about, but I talk about them all the time everywhere I go, so if I feel more relaxed about it than you do, that's okay. Just borrow a little bit of my freedom this morning to not feel terrified of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I want to start by this. Nineteen years ago, I was sitting on the couch of my youth pastor and his wife, and I was 21 years old at the time, and I was a leader with them in their youth ministry. In fact, I was the assistant director of the youth ministry under them. I had spent every, like, every waking moment, every free moment with them and in their home, and I was sitting on their couch because I was there that night to confess some sin in my life that I had hidden for two years. And just to paint the picture for you, on their couch, and for about an hour, all I could do was cry. Because I could not bring myself to say the words that I knew that I needed to say. And as I sat on that couch, weeping, not being able to bring myself to speak, James, my, my pastor, picked up his Bible and he opened it to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And he simply began to read at verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now you have to understand that the second those words came out of his mouth, I knew that he knew my sin. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he knew my sin. And I knew that as soon as this evening was over, I was going to be removed, kicked out, and rejected by this church. I absolutely knew it with all my heart. So the moment he said, do you not know, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom, to me it was just that moment of like, game over. I'm going to experience rejection. He kept reading, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. And that's where he stopped. And I knew that he knew my sin. And the most uncomfortable, condemning silence I have ever felt in my entire life settled over me. And I knew that he knew. And he waited, which what seemed like an eternity, which was probably only a few seconds. And he continued, nor the thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revelers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And he stopped. He put down his Bible and he said, Drew, is your sin in this list? I said, yes. And I want to take you back several, several years. You see, because I did not start my life as the broken homosexual offender on that couch. See, I accepted Christ when I was four years old. Now, I share that because, first off, I think that a lot of people think that, I mean, it's, we all know this if you are a Christian, but becoming a Christian does not make you immune to struggle or sin. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, I accepted Christ when I was four years old. I can still remember the, the nursery of the church. It was in the First Church of God in Yakima, Washington, where I grew up in central Washington. And I can still remember the walls of the nursery. They were painted like Noah's Ark, like I think was in the bylaws of every church in the 80s. Um, you have to paint it like Noah's Ark. And, and um, you know, it's an odd decor choice for children because we know that the flood was to wipe out humanity. And so it's like nothing screams nursery like God's judgment. So um, I'm just saying. Um, but I remember it, and I remember the walls, and I remember the teacher, and I remember feeling a deep conviction on my heart that I needed a Savior. Now, I don't know if it was because I was convicted of some sort of sin, 
That's generally how you realize you need a savior is that you need saving. And I don't know if it was that I had recently stole a cookie from the cookie jar, a sin that I am very familiar with, even to this day, as you might tell. Um, or if it was because, you know, I have an identical twin brother and something about having an identical twin just makes you want to sin all the time. I will let you know I am not the evil twin. It is my other, it is my brother. I am the good one. But even so, they lead you into temptation. The Lord doesn't, but your evil twin does. I hope he doesn't listen to this. But I will say that I was convicted over my need for a Savior, and I gave my life to Jesus at four years old, and it was a real thing for me. It was a real decision for me. And when I was in kindergarten at five or six years old, I, Jesus was important to me, and my faith was important to me, and I was a little evangelist on the playground. And I wasn't very sophisticated in my attempts to evangelize, but I was very effective. So I would say such things like, oh, do you know Jesus? And, and one of the little kids would be like, well, no, who's Jesus? I said, oh, you're going to hell, you know? And it was surprisingly effective to threaten children with hell in kindergarten because they do repent on the playground. I was, I was leading revivals, I tell you, in grade school. Um, and I share this kind of to be funny about it, but this is a real story. Like, this was how I approached my relationship with God. It was very much based on punishment and fear and him being my savior. I was grateful for a savior, but I didn't really know the love of God very well. I knew I needed a savior and it was important to me and it was my faith. And, you know, so much of our childhoods we can paint in, in, in memories of, of events or, or, or in, in rose-colored glasses. And, and for me, I look back on those years in my first introduction to church and Jesus, and it was very, very peaceful, at least from my perspective. But something changed in my life at about eight years old. That's when my parents' marriage fell completely apart. How many of you know that you can't add one broken person and add it to another broken person to have a perfect marriage? You just can't do that. And, you know, I, I try very hard to honor my parents when I share my testimony so that I don't really want to share a lot of details of what led to their divorce. But what I will say is they both came out of a lot of brokenness in their history. And even though they were in the church, being in the church doesn't make you healed. And they, we were in a church culture where in that particular time and season, people weren't very honest about the things they were dealing with. And when you were honest about it, you generally weren't treated with a lot of grace. And so their marriage fell completely apart. And the consequences of the divorce had a great impact on my brothers and I. And not to blame either parent, but what resulted in that case was that my dad was estranged from us children for a number of years. Um, you know, before the divorce, my dad, I have great memories of things that my dad and I did together but I have scarce memories of them. My dad, he, in his um, upbringing, to be a father was to be a provider, and he was an incredible provider. But unfortunately, what his drive to provide, us, uh, provide for us did was it deprived of, us, of his time and of attention. And you know, I can't really blame him for not giving us something he never received, but what I can say is regardless of that, it left me empty and it left me wanting connection. And with the divorce and with that estrangement and with all the pain that came from the years following, I was left in a lot of need and brokenness and pain. And, my, and when my parents divorced, one of the most significant moments of, of my life in that time period was I remember we were in that season where our parents were separated and they were heading towards divorce. And it was around this time of year, just, just real close to Thanksgiving. And the church that we were involved in was doing a Thanksgiving meal fellowship meal, kind of like, you know, not on Thanksgiving, but the bad potluck you do beforehand to say we're having church Thanksgiving. Do you all know what I'm talking about in your histories? Some of you are like, yes, I remember, you know, 18,000 versions of jello salad and nothing edible, you know, it was just, but I remember this and we were, we were walking through this, this area, this cafeteria, because we had it at this junior high cafeteria, and we were walking around this cafeteria trying to find a place to sit, and it was almost as if people began spreading out at their tables so that there wasn't room for our family. And I can't tell you what it felt like to be in this church 
where this is where you learned that Jesus loved you and that he loves sinners and that you're, you know, come just as you are. Well, we're in this season of incredible pain and upheaval and loss. And all we're trying to do is sit down and eat our jello salad. And people won't let us sit with them. And, you know, it's in these moments of pain and brokenness and woundedness that Satan inserts lies into our hearts so subtly that we don't even know he's doing it. And I, I can look back now. I couldn't articulate it as an eight-year-old back then, but I can articulate it now and how it affected me moving forward as Satan began to speak this lie over my heart. He said, see, you don't share your sin in church or you get rejected. And the funny thing is, my parents' divorce wasn't my sin. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't, it wasn't because of me. It wasn't because of my brothers. But because this church wasn't handling it well, the explicit message that they shared with us was, you're not welcome in the house of God when you're going through sin and brokenness. And somewhere in my eight-year-old heart and mind, that, that seed, that lie took root, and this extreme fear of sharing struggle or weakness or pain or sin took root. Now, it wasn't too much longer into life, several years moving forward, when my, my parents into their divorce and my dad estranged from us and my mom attempting to, to um, get her life together. She dropped us off at my grandparents' house one day. She said, I'll be back. And she moved away for six months. And, you know, it was her attempt to try to figure out how to live a life as a single mom and try to provide for us. And, but what it said to me in that season was, not only does my church reject me, which is God, the Father rejects me, and my dad has rejected me because he's gone. Now my mom has rejected me. And so I, I don't know if you can understand what it is. Maybe some of you can, and I, it breaks my heart if you can understand this. But every sure thing that God has put in your life to be stable has now been ripped from you. And it's interesting what the human heart does in a moment like that. You begin to build walls of defense because you think the people who I'm supposed to trust most, I can't trust at all to love me and to be there for me. So I can't really trust anybody with my heart. And so I'm going to detach a bit from this and protect myself. Well, that's not a healthy response, but it's certainly an understandable one, isn't it? So at about nine years old, this, this void begins forming in my heart of, of connection with people that are supposed to love me and that aren't. And so I, I think that you can get the feeling that, that this is not going to set me up for success very well. It was around the same time that I began recognizing that I had a desire to connect with men. But it scared me. It wasn't, it wasn't a sexual desire at any stretch of the imagination at nine years old. It was an emotional need. And I had this desire to connect with the boys in my class, in my school, that seemed like they had it all together and everything was going well for them. You see, I am, you know, the, here's a few other facts about me. I have always been very short, like very short. Um, my ears haven't. I just grew into them this year. So I'm very excited about that because they're a bit more proportional to my body. But I was a weird-looking kid. Like, I was curly, fuzzy-haired, big-eared, short, really insecure kid. This does not scream, pick me first for gym. This is not like the experience that I had. So I saw kids that seemed to have things figured out. They had sports figured out. They had social connections figured out. And I wanted to be like them and I wanted to be near them, but I had no way of bridging that gap. And so I just felt this longing to connect with them and an inability to do that. See, the most influential people in my life were women, particularly my mom, who I longed to, you know, have a relationship with, and she did eventually come back. But more than that, the most consistent, safe presence in my life was my grandma. I loved my grandma very much. She's gone on to be with the Lord now, but she is such a strong, dynamic woman, and she was the safest person in my life. And I learned how to communicate, really, from her. I learned how to fight for myself from her. I learned how to cook from her. And so these were the things I was learning at like age eight, nine, 10. I was great at baking. This does not help you on the playground. You know, Drew, you want to play kickball? No, I do not, but creme brulee? You know, it's not helpful skill 
on the playground. So I share that to say I didn't have a means of connection. Now I want to ask this question, and this is crowd participation, but don't worry, it has nothing to do with sex. So you can answer and not be feeling weird. How many of you can remember grade school? Now I do, I understand some of you, it's a longer journey, but <laughs> if you can raise, remember grade school, raise your hands. Okay, women in the room, because you tend to be more interactive in these moments. Sorry, men, we just need to learn to talk more. Um, but women in the room, if you can think back to first and second grade, what did boys have in first or second grade? Cooties, I heard it, I heard it. <laughs> Universal answer, no matter where I go, it takes about 1.5 seconds for some woman to say cooties. And the reality is, in that time period of life, boys do not care about interacting with girls. Girls do not care about interacting with boys. They want to interact with one another. In fact, the standard operating procedure, if there is even a bridge to cross relationally, is like, hi, <clears throat> you know, that's about it. You know, you want to, guys are like the club where no girls allowed. Girls are like cooties, and it's just that reality because God has designed us all to connect first with the same sex and not the opposite. It's a need that we have to feel known and to feel affirmed and to feel like we belong. This is a human need. You know, C.S. Lewis, great theologian and author, said human need, it won't be denied. It's going to be met rightly or it's going to be met wrongly, but it won't be denied. In Proverbs 27, 7, it says this, To him who is well fed, honey is not desirable. But to him who is starving, the bitter thing will seem to taste sweet. In modern language, I would put it this way, bad love is better than no love at all. Now, to illustrate the point that this is universal, we are going, I'm going to ask you a question, you're going to respond to it. How many of you have ever eaten at Taco Bell? Raise your hand. Okay, not everyone raised their hand. Okay, so here's the thing. If I have to be up here talking about sexual brokenness, you have to admit to eating fast food. It's only fair. So I'm going to widen the net and say, if you have ever received a meal through the window of your car, raise your hand. Then you know bad love is better than no love at all. Because it doesn't matter. We know that's not a healthy decision. Nobody thinks, here's a good idea. Taco Bell. You know, it's what, what we're driven by is our hunger and our need to feed that hunger. We are not making a rational choice. We are not making a healthy choice. I am fully aware of that, but we are driven by I'm hungry. And Taco Bell tastes good, and it smells good, and it's relatively cheap, and it's very quick. And you don't have to do anything except for roll up and say, Chalupa. You know, that's all you need to do. And your need will be satiated because you are, your hunger is met with something that will not nourish you, that will not actually give you what you need, but it will give you the sense that what you need has been met. You see, Taco Bell and sin are very similar. <laughs> it will make you fat, it will give you gas, and eventually kill you. That is what sin does, metaphorically speaking. And if we understand this, this is a deeply theological conversation, if you can't tell. If we understand this, and we can understand and relate to anybody who makes wrong choices, because bad love is better than no love at all. You see, none of, some of you might not have struggled with same-sex attraction issues, but if you can understand, if you can equate hunger and Taco Bell, recognizing that's not a good choice, but sometimes hunger dictates that you get hunger met, and it doesn't care how, you just can't starve anymore, then you can understand where I was at. You see, my heart had been closed off to people loving me because I'd been deeply hurt. And the very people that were meant to feed those needs for me for same-sex love and affirmation and security and identity, they weren't there. And then what happens, what always happens, is that Satan tempts people to wound other people in the places of their greatest woundedness. He's very crafty that way. He's not a creator, but he's a great manipulator. And so because I needed affirmation from other men and from other boys, the stepfather that I had in my life beat me and, and made fun of me and rejected me and hurt me and made me feel as worthless as I already believed I was. And the boys in my school, they called me sissy, fag, queer, all these wonderful words of life that speak to an identity that wasn't true but was becoming more true the more they said it. 
And I wasn't gay. I was in need. And that need wasn't going to go away. You see, the thing is, need doesn't go away. And milestone needs don't go away just because you hit another milestone, meaning this. My need is to first connect with the same sex. It's true for all of us. If that need doesn't get met, it doesn't go away. But then puberty hits and and hormones hit. And it makes something that's already confusing and unfair even more so. Needs that have nothing to do with sex become sexualized. And it certainly hit for me at age 13, 14 years old when I began realizing I'm not attracted to women. I'm attracted to men. And that terrified me. Not because I feared that my parents would reject me for homosexuality. I have an uncle who's, who's gay identified. He's been in my life since I was born. He's always been gay. No one has ever rejected him in our family. We absolutely love him. Like, I'm not, I don't fear. I didn't fear rejection from my parents. Homosexuality was a reality in our family. I grew up in the church, and I knew what they felt about homosexuality. When I said that the second James started saying those words, do you not know the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God, there's a reason I knew that passage. I grew up in, in, in church in the 80s, which was the beginning of the AIDS crisis. It was that moment where many pastors began speaking about how AIDS was God's judgment against the homosexual community. Before we even understood AIDS, before we fully understood its transmission, before we understood anything, the church's response was not compassion, it was judgment. And every passage I ever heard spoken about homosexuality had judgment in it. It had condemnation in it. It had hatred in it. And I understand and I am not saying that we should not declare sinful behavior as sinful behavior. What I'm saying is, when we read that list in 1 Corinthians, I bet every single one of us can find ourselves in there somewhere. Why did I feel condemned more so than the liars or the swindlers or the gossips? Or the adulterers, because in our current culture, we know that many people struggle with pornography. And Jesus said, if you look lustfully, you're guilty of adultery. So just about everybody can find themselves somewhere in this list. Why is mine the worst? Why did I know the second he read this, that he knew that I was, I had done this? Why did I not fear the gossip I had done the year before? Or the week before, let's be honest, or the day before? I didn't fear that condemnation. I I knew that he knew that I had interacted with this issue. So at 14 years old, I find myself struggling, very aware that I'm struggling. I I need you to know, I had not been back to church since I was nine at this point because the church rejected us. And my parents divorced and everything was a mess. And then at 14 years old, my mom decided that she wanted my brother and I kind of away for a week. We were, you know, 14-year-old boys are not always the most pleasant people to be around. So she sent us to, to church camp because that's a logical thing to do. You know, you haven't been to church in years, so you send them to church camp with the very church that rejected you. I was not thrilled to go to this camp. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. It was on the Oregon coast, It was six days long. And I'll tell you what, I expected to be rejected. I expected to be told a number of things about how I need water. Can I grab that? I expected to be told a number of things about how awful I was. I just expected no one to love me. What I experienced at that camp was the love of Jesus. And I rededicated my life to Jesus at that camp at 14 years old. And it's interesting to me because I experienced such love and such grace there in that camp. But then immediately began fearing that if I was honest with anybody about what I was experiencing internally, that I was going to be rejected again. It's a logical conclusion being that this was the church I was rejected at before. And then as years go by, I get involved in youth group, and I'm, I'm, I'm very involved in youth group, and the pastor, the youth pastor began sharing, this was a different youth pastor than I spoke of before, but he began sharing from his testimony growing up in Oklahoma. One of the things he used to do before he got saved was go to a park where gay men went to connect, and he would beat them up. 
So this was not a safe person to share my struggle with. Then he again be began promoting an idea or a belief that anyone who struggled with homosexuality was demon-possessed. So that wasn't safe. I spent three years of my high school life trying to cast demons out of myself. It didn't work. Demons out, you know, does not work. It was completely an unsafe environment to share what I was struggling with. And yet, I was trying to follow Jesus. Now, how many of you know that if you try to follow Jesus, but you do so from a place of fear and performance-based Christianity, that does not work? You see, I was terrified. Everything that I did in youth group and everything that I did in church was a way to try to make up for what I felt was broken and dirty and despicable on the inside. So I was on the evangelism team. I was on the, the worship team. I was a part-time janitor of the church. I was on the Bible quizzing team. I was on the drama team. I know that's a real big shock. That was a joke. <laughs> I did everything I could to try to make up for the, the brokenness I felt was inside that was not addressable. And I had no idea that God loved me. It was like you walk near the love of God and you feel it, but you don't receive it. So that feeling of proximity, of closeness, do you know what I mean when you walk into a place and you know God's presence is there and you know his love is present, but there's something that won't let you enter into it? That was my whole life, feeling like I just couldn't let the wall down. I knew he was right there, but I couldn't because I believed he would reject me. But yet I wanted to prove love to him. I wanted to prove that I was worth it to him. And so I reached 18 years old, and I, the, the youth pastor I, that had been at my church, he moved on to Colorado Springs, and he had a tendency of taking on interns to help with youth ministry, and I had felt like I had a call of ministry on my life. And so I decided at 18 years old, on my 18th birthday, three days after graduating from high school, I would get in my car and move from Yakima, Washington to Colorado Springs to be an intern with him. And I did that. And I worked feverishly to prove that I was somehow worthy of God's love and worthy of, of love at all. And all I experienced at that church was, you're not good enough. You're not, you're not smart enough. You're not whatever enough. And finally, I reached a point after seven months of being an intern there, um, I, I reached kind of this breaking point where I had to leave couple details to that. I also had a small tumor growing that I needed to go take care of, little medical issue. Went back to my pastor, said, I, I have to go home to Washington State to get this checked. I won't be back until the 3rd of January. And, and the, the, the general feeling of this, this experience was, he said to me, well, if you're not back for our New Year's Eve event, then don't bother coming back at all. And I said, but I have a tumor. I can't get into the doctor until the 2nd of January. He said, don't bother coming back if you don't come back by the 31st at all. Well, I had already bought my plane ticket, so I said, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to leave. I won't be there for the event. I will come back, but it's just to get my stuff and say goodbye. So I went back to this youth group that I served in under this youth pastor who I had been with for six years. And after finishing my, la my last night of youth group there and being publicly shamed by him, he walked me to the door of the church and he said, you know, you broke a covenant of ministry with me. And because of that, you're going to incur a curse from God. Have a safe drive home. You see, in my mind, I already felt cursed. I already felt broken beyond repair. I already felt unacceptable before God. So when he said that you're going to incur a curse, I said, I already have. Internally, I'm already cursed. What can you do to me? And that whole drive home from Colorado Springs, Colorado to Yakima, Washington, it's about 22 and a half hours. I didn't stop driving. And I thought the entire time, like, you know what, God? I have worked so hard to be loved by you. I have worked so hard to be acceptable to you. I've done everything I know to do to be worthy of your love, and you have not done anything to show me that I'm loved. You know what, God, I want to feel loved. And you haven't done it. You know, talk about feeling disappointment from God. You haven't done it, God. So you know what? If I have the chance to be loved, I'm going to take it. Because your love is unfulfilling. That was my prayer, driving home from my internship in Colorado and reaching Yakima, Washington and 
plugging right back into church to do all the same things that I had done before because although that is where I was at, I was terrified of leaving the one place that I was connected. At this point in my life, you have to understand my family was a mess. I had no relationship with my mom. I had no relationship with my dad, really. My brother, that's strained. My f- church was my family. And so I went right back into serving the church at this broken place of disappointment with God, needs never being met, lies being consistently spoken over me, this constant struggle with attraction I did not understand and nobody was speaking to, no redemption ever being spoken of in my church, and with a broken and needy heart, I went right back into church. And I learned something very quickly that you do not give the devil that much permission to work in your life. Because it wasn't four months later that I met a guy at church who was struggling secretly just like I was. And I saw him and I was, I was immediately attracted to him. And I thought, you know, he needs a friend. That's code for I'm attracted to you and I'm gonna find a way to relate to you covertly. And so I struck up a friendship with him. And within one month, that friendship turned into a sexual relationship. Because to the starving, the bitter thing will seem to taste sweet. <clears throat> and you know, we don't talk about this enough in church culture, but sin is satisfying for a season. Or else we wouldn't do it. You know, we're always told how awful sin is, how horrible it is, but I will tell you the truth that for the first time in my life in that two, three months of the beginning of that relationship, I felt more known and loved and safe and and secure than I'd ever felt in my entire life because here was a person who knew everything about me and still wanted me, was still there, still loved me, still valued me. And sex is a very compelling thing because it provides intimacy in a right relationship, but it provides false intimacy in a wrong relationship. And intimacy, no matter what, if you're longing for it, feels fulfilling. And so for several months, this relationship was, it was great. Of course, it was completely secret and I was living a double life because I was not going to tell anyone what I was doing and neither was he. And so for several months, it just, it just, you know, sin was very satisfying. Much like Taco Bell for the first hour after you eat it. And then the regret. And I remember that I was, you know, one day I was in the shower and it was just, those are the moments that it seems like the Holy Spirit is the most free to, you know, talk to me because there's just nothing on my mind and it's just the most isolated place. And I remember the Holy Spirit so gently and lovingly saying to me, Drew, if this relationship is so good, why are you hiding it from everybody? You know, he was, it was a very convicting question, but nowhere in it was condemnation. He was holding up a mirror to something in my life and saying, you need to look at this. And I remember replying, I don't want to talk about it. Thinking, well, you haven't given me anything, so you don't have the right. It was very snarky with the Lord. And then it just... Day after day after day, question after question from the Holy Spirit just kept coming up, revealing the brokenness and the dissatisfaction in this relationship and the inadequacy of it to actually address the issues of my heart. And it was a really uncomfortable thing because I knew everything that God was saying was true. And it turned from this entitlement towards like, well, your love isn't good to this reality of like, if I let this go, I'm going to have nothing. And it became more terrifying to have nothing than it did to be disobedient to God. I didn't want to let go of it. Because literally it was as if saying, God, I have been starving for my whole life. I finally had a meal. And now you're telling me to go back to starving. And I can't do it. I can't do that. So I hid the relationship for a few more months and I kept it in this relationship. And then one day, um, I found myself at my new youth pastor at his house. I want to tell you a little context for that. When this old youth pastor left, he he went away and and I was really wounded by him. And then this new youth pastor came in, he and his wife. 
James and Amy Payton. They'd moved from Los Angeles to come to Yakima, Washington to help pastor this church. James was a six foot four Olympic hammer thrower. He's a big man. I don't know if he's actually six foot four, but I'm really short, so everyone's like six four to me. So, but he was really big, and he was an Olympic hammer thrower. He's a beast of a man. And his wife was shorter and smaller, and she was more intimidating than he was. That's just the dynamic of their relationship. He was big and herking, but tender and kind and loving. And she was short and petite, and you don't cross her. She will rip your face off. Like, I don't, I mean, she's in Jesus' name, but I mean, she's a very dynamic woman. And I met them, the day that I met them was the day that my grandpa died, who I lived with. He died in the morning. He had wrestled through cancer for 10 years. He had passed away. I had pulled him off of his bed and tried to give him CPR to revive him. He died. The ambulance came, took him away. The, the, I mean, literally, he died that morning. And that afternoon, their U-Haul pulled up, and I was there at their house helping unload because I was so desperate to be loved by people that it didn't matter that the only consistent man in my life had just passed away. I was going to be the good Christian and unload the youth pastor's U-Haul. And I remember unloading their U-Haul, and there was this chair that I was unloading for him, and it had all the fabric taken off because Amy was, she was very crafty, and she was reupholstering it. And I said to her, as I'm pulling this up, I said, oh, are you reupholstering this chair? And she said, yes, and how did you know that word? You know, it's not a common word. I said, well, my grandpa was an upholsterer by trade. He was excellent at it. She was, was? And I said, yeah, unfortunately, he's passed away. And she said, oh, I'm so sorry. When? I said, this morning, as I'm walking. And she went, James? Where's James? Like, and I, and I remember later in life, she was, finds her husband, she says, this kid's got some problems. Like, why is he here? But they were just very loving to me. I remember when I was going to, we had his memorial time. It was only a week later. And, you know, there wasn't really a funeral. I had to kind of perform it because I was the most spiritual person in my family. And I had lunch with James that day before the funeral because I was talking to him about youth ministry and what role I might have in it and trying to prove that I was valuable. And after the lunch, he said, well, where are you off to next? I said, well, I'm going to this thing. And he's like, well, what thing? I said, oh, it's just, just grandpa's funeral. And he looked at me again, and I, they must have had the conversation before, and he said, can I go with you? And I said, why? Because your family's grieving, right? And I said, I suppose. And he said, I'd just like to be there with you. And in my head, I thought, what's your game? What's your angle? sure, you can come to a funeral, knock yourself out. And I remember watching this big, burly man stand with my tiny little grandma and weeping with her. And I thought, you don't even know her. What are you doing? Stop. You're going to make me love you, and I don't want that. And I just was confused by it. So you know, I found myself this one day, to jump forward in the story, I found myself at their home, because again, although I was involved in this relationship, I was still involved in everything at church. Couldn't let down the double life. And I had been hanging out with them, and I was on my way out the door to go from there to my boyfriend's house to connect with him, living the double life. And as I got to the door, Amy stopped me. She said, Drew, I need to say something to you. And James said, Amy, be nice. And I thought, oh no, you know, because Amy's going to kill me, you know. And, and she said, James, I need to say this. And I thought, oh, what's, what's going on? And she looked at me square in the eye with the most compassion in her eyes. And she said, Drew, you're in sin. Please repent. We love you. And you're not the same kid we met when we moved here. Please repent. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. She said, you do. Your sin is killing you. Please repent. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I've got to go. And I left. And that was all they ever said to me. All she ever said. She didn't name my sin. She just simply called out the fact that I was, I was broken and I was getting worse. 
I left there and I drove about a mile down the road and I remember, I don't know if any of you have ever been caught in sin or confronted in sin, but I think sometimes, I know for me, the first reaction was anger. Really defensive anger. Like, how dare she? And how dare you, God? How dare, you know, angry response. And then that quickly moved into fear. Like, oh no, oh no, God is telling people. And then I had these flashes of like Nathan and David, and I'm like, you are that man. You know, there's a flashing in my head. I'm like, is she going to publicly expose me? What's going to happen? Because God is telling people. But she didn't know. Maybe she didn't really know because she didn't say it specifically. Maybe I'm still hiding it well enough. And then that fear turned into just deep sadness. And I pulled over along the side of the road, and I knew, I knew I was in sin. And I knew I was wrong, and I knew that I needed to break this off of my life. And I drove from that point to my boyfriend's house. I walked in the door, and I said, I have sinned with you. I have sinned against you, and I've sinned against God, and I can't do this anymore. Please forgive me and never speak to me again. I broke that relationship. I walked away, and I never again stepped into another sexual relationship with a man. And I left that house, and I tell you what, if I, if I had felt guilty by just my temptations before, I felt a million times more dirty and guilty now, having gone ahead and done it, because that's the trick of Satan. You know, he makes you feel guilty for feeling tempted, and then tempts you to do it anyway, and then once you've tasted that you've participated in it, and then he just heaps more condemnation on you to begin with. And it doesn't matter what the sin is. It's always the same. And then the lie begins saying, if they knew what you've actually done, you're going to get rejected. And he borrows on history to let you know how true that will be. And so for me, in that moment, I said, okay, I've repented. God, you've forgiven me, I think. And so now I have to do everything I can to hide and to prove that I'm good again. And two years of striving to prove that I was worthy ended up with me back on that couch on that night not being able to say my sin. It's funny, you know, in the story of the prodigal son, he comes to his senses in the pig pen, and then it seems like a moment later he's, he's being met by his father, but we never really know how long it took him to get home how long that journey was from conviction to really experiencing the Father's love. And I can tell you, for me, it was that two years. It was a long walk home. And I want that to be instructive for us to recognize that there are prodigals in our church, sometimes serving in ministry, who don't know they're loved and don't know they're forgiven and don't know that God has washed them clean because they're still on the way home. Even if they're in our pews and in our churches, they're still on their way home. And for two years, I was on my way home, and I got to that couch, and I got to that night, and I sat there, and James read that passage, and I knew, I knew that they knew my sin, and I knew that they knew, and I knew that I was getting kicked out of the church, and I knew that I was getting rejected because the last time sin was exposed in my family, that's exactly what happened. And as I sat there, and I nodded my head, yes, this sin, this is my sin, Amy, in all of her tact, I said, oh yeah, we already knew. I said, what? I said, we've known for two years. I said, what? She named the person, she named when the relationship started, and she named when it ended. And I looked at them, I said, I don't understand. I've been in your home five nights a week for the last two years. You made me the assistant director of youth ministry. You never once, never once rejected me. I don't understand. That doesn't make sense because you see, if you knew you would have rejected me, if you knew you never would have trusted me, how is that possible? And James looked at me square in the eye with tears coming down his face and he said, well, we love you. And we wanted you to feel safe enough to tell us yourself. We knew you had repented. We just knew you didn't feel safe. Church, I accepted Jesus as my Savior at four years old. I met Jesus that night with the full love and grace of the Father. 
demonstrated in two years of patient love by people that really, really knew how afraid and scared I was. They waited for me to come home. And they met me with the love of Jesus. And as I sat there weeping, and it was like, if you've ever seen that movie, The Matrix, years ago, it's like all this information downloads into you suddenly in a moment. It's like when you get a revelation from God and something your whole life suddenly makes sense. Two years of love was downloaded into my heart. In a way, I never could explain it any other way other than saying God met me there. And I wept. And James said, have you ever heard the rest of the passage? And I said, there is no rest to that passage. It ends with condemnation will not inherit the kingdom of God, right? Because that's all I'd ever heard. But he said, no, verse 11 changes the game. He says, but that's what some of you were. But you were washed and you were justified and you were sanctified by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. He said, Drew, it's not what you are anymore. He said, you know, we don't know how to help you walk through this, but what we know is God saw fit to include in his scripture. That's what some of the church was. It's not what they are anymore. So whatever it takes, we're going to walk with you while we figure this out together. And then we just sat and wept for a while. And I'll tell you the truth. I would have, when I walked into that house that night, I would have rather killed myself than anyone know my sin, but I knew I had to confess. That was the two years of living, of fear constantly that people would find out. I left that house and I confessed my sin to 50 people in four days. Because freedom feels good. Suddenly when Satan's lie is dispelled, you're like, well, I don't even care. Because, you know, if you want to reject me, you can reject me because I know God loves me and accepts me. And so I confess to 50 people. I don't recommend this. But I confess to 50 people in four days and I'll tell you the truth, there was only one semi-negative reaction, and it wasn't even really all that negative. It was just a senior pastor of the church where I confessed, and he was like, this is a beautiful testimony. Now, quiet down. <laughs> like, some people will not be able to handle this, and they might crucify you for this story. And I said, well, I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. It is Christ that lives within me. Well, life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I'm like, the crucifixion is good enough for Jesus? Good enough for me. I was a little bit, you know, snarky there too. A bit of an issue with my character. And I understand later that he was just trying to protect me, but honestly, it was just everyone else, every other person I confessed to, here was their reaction. Wow. Thank you for sharing that with me. That took a lot of guts. Can I tell you what I'm struggling with and won't tell anyone? And I thought, no, I'm not here for you. <laughs> that is not what this was about. It was really interesting that suddenly when I took off the mask and got honest, it gave people permission to, because you know what? I wasn't the only one Satan was lying to. I was not the only one Satan was lying to. I'm still not the only one that Satan is lying to. And some, somehow, with my sin, which seemed like classified in our church as the worst of all, there was suddenly no fear with anyone like confessing their other stuff that were small potatoes compared to homosexuality. You know what? If I have to kick the door open to God's grace, I'll do it. Yeah. Suddenly, a lot of people were marching in, and it changed the culture of our church. I didn't ask for that. That just sort of happened. And it's funny, here I was in this church in Yakima, Washington, which seems like a really great place for God to continue to heal my heart. But within a few months, which is a story too long to tell, God picked me up and moved me to Portland, Oregon, which I always say is a strange place to send someone to recover from homosexuality. <laughs> it's like from the frying pan into the fire, you know? But I'll tell you the truth. My second day in Portland, I was working as a waiter at this restaurant called the Old Spaghetti Factory. And there's a Bible college in Portland called Multnomah Bible College. And it's interesting because it seems like half the Bible college worked at this particular old spaghetti factory, and I just found myself there working. And the guy who was my trainer for my third night there 
was a recent graduate from Multnomah Bible College. He became a good friend of mine. And I remember, like, I had wanted to go to Multnomah because I was called to ministry, but I couldn't afford it because Bible college is expensive, which is really counterintuitive because you don't make a lot in ministry. Seems like that student debt is like a curse or something. I don't know. But that's a whole other sermon. But I remember sitting there with him, and he was a recent graduate, and I, and I said, do you go to Multnomah? He goes, no, I just graduated from there. I had this really bad attitude, and I looked at him square in the eye and said, how dare you? How dare you be so ungrateful for the education some of us want but can't afford? You should be ashamed of your ingratitude. And he looked, I'm like, and pass the spaghetti, you know? And it's like, so he looked at me and he goes, do you want to be my friend? And I thought, I have been trying my whole life to make friends with guys. I didn't know this is how you do it. Insult them. That's great. And I said, sure, I'll be your friend. Three days into hanging out with him, I said, listen, here's the deal. This, you need to know what I struggle with. Because I'm, I moved from this town, and, and everyone knew, and I'm not going to go back into hiding in fear. So if you're going to love me, if you're going to be my friend, you're going to know what I deal with. Because I'd rather you reject me now than later. And so I said, here's what I deal with. And I shared with him, and he said the same thing. Wow, can I tell you what I struggle with? And I'm like, why do people keep doing that? <laughs> sure, and so he shared his life. And then after we were concluding our conversation, he goes, oh, you know, you need to meet my friend Jason. He runs this ministry called Portland Fellowship that helps men and women walk out of that. In fact, he comes out of a homosexual background, and he's married now. And you know what? It's a pretty cool testimony. You ought to meet him. I was 22 years old at that point. Why in 22 years of life and being encountering the church did it take that long to hear a redemption story from someone from the struggle? I don't know. But I know now it's my personal mission to make sure that doesn't happen for a lot of people, that you hear the redemption possible in Jesus. And I found my way into that ministry and and, uh, you know, when I got there, they have a two-year discipleship program. I entered that program. I thought I was walking in there with one problem, and that was my homosexual struggle. I very quickly learned that I have a whole lot of other problems. You know, it's funny. You'll meet people out of this struggle who will pray often, Lord, take this from me, take this from me. The gay community is full of people who come out of a Christian background who prayed for God to take away their homosexual struggle, and he doesn't do it because it's a symptom. It's not the real problem. And what good, phys- what good doctor would ever let a patient come in and say, hey, I have a symptom, I know the treatment plan, do what I tell you to do. No, a good doctor is going to say, that's a symptom, let's figure out what the cause is. And certainly the great physician is better than any old doctor, and he knows how to heal us, but it's not always in our way and our, our purposes and times. You see, my struggle was a symptom of my broken heart. My heart was the problem, not my attractions. And so God spent years in my involvement in Portland Fellowship exposing the broken places in my heart, slowly but surely, because that was the real issue. And suddenly the attraction was just an annoying symptom I was willing to bear with while dealing with the real problem. Much like if you go in to the doctor and you have a headache, and you say, I have a headache, treat the headache, and the doctor says, you have a tumor, it's causing the headache. You will go through anything to get rid of the tumor so that you can live even surviving much worse than a headache, and eventually the headache will go away, just not on your timing. And so God began to do that surgery in my soul. And over the course of years, God began to heal so many different broken places of my life, and I am so grateful he didn't take the symptom away so that he could deal with the the cause. I know God in a way that I never would have without the struggle, without having to walk through it. And, you know, years into it, I got to this place where I felt like, well, I'm not gay. I'm not struggling with that, really. I don't feel straight. I'm just a good, pure bachelor to the rapture. You know, beam me up, Jesus, at any moment. Because I just really didn't have a vision that God could give me more. And that's when I met Suzanne. She's so cute. I will say this. When I met her, It is a terrible thing to have to go through puberty twice in one lifetime. (laughs) Because I was like 24 years old and I'm like, what are these strange feelings, you know? (laughs) You're pretty and I can't talk now, I don't know why. (laughs) So I'm writing notes, do you like me? Check the box. (laughs) You know, and it's just this weird, like, (sighs) and um, we met 
and we went on our first date. She actually turned me down for my first attempt to go on a date with her because I didn't realize she does not like formal events. She does not like dresses. She likes a hoodie and jeans. That's my wife. She's a Northwest girl. She grew up in Seattle. She's like, dresses are impractical in the rain. So, you know, she, I invited her to a formal event. She said no, and I said, you know what? I'm not going to let you ruin my budding heterosexuality. I will take you to dinner, even if it's not at this event. And she said, I didn't say it like that. I said, okay, I still want to take you to dinner. Can I take you to dinner somewhere? And she said, well, sure. We had our first date. I knew that date that she had two options to marry me or to break my heart. She was not on board that quickly, but I was. <laughs> Six months later, I asked her to marry me. Seven months after that, we got married. And now she has given me three beautiful daughters who I will say make me struggle with men very differently than I did before. <laughs> it's less of a in the closet kind of struggle and more of a shotgun in the closet kind of struggle. My oldest is 11 and a half years old. She is a young woman. I'm going to kill most men that ever come near her. Uh, someone once said to me, what man is ever going to be good enough for your daughters? And I said, squarely, you're looking them in the eye. I know exactly what man is good enough for my daughters. Jesus. <laughs> I might have to lighten up a bit on that. But I'll tell you, the journey for my wife and I, my healing did not end because I got married. Many, any of you who are married will tell you that's probably one of the more sanctifying experiences you can go through. God works on our hearts through marriage, and God continues to heal the broken places or the immature places or the disordered places in my heart 20 years into this journey. God continues to heal relationships around me. I have a great relationship with my mom. I have a great relationship with my dad. I have restored relationships in my life. Some of them took a lot longer than, than, than I would have liked, but you know what? 20 years to fight for redemption is is just fine with me when you get it. You know, um, I didn't know that I wanted to be a father. I, in fact, I thought I didn't want to be one because I was afraid I'd screw up any kids I had. Here's a newsflash. Every parent screws up their kids. <laughs> so our prayer just became, we will screw them up. Let's just screw them up in a way that makes them quirky rather than dysfunctional. <laughs> so far, so good. Um, but God had to heal that place in my heart because I had an accusation against him that I was never fathered, and that meant he never fathered me. And when we sing good, good father, let me tell you, for a lot of years, that felt like a really hard thing to say about God. But God exposes these accusations in our heart to heal them. And he exposed that accusation in my heart not long before we got pregnant with my first child. And he began healing my heart through that. And God continues to heal my heart and continues to give me the joy of watching my life transform in ways I never thought could happen. Because it doesn't matter what we've done. We all can find ourselves in a list of sins. We all can be tempted to identify ourselves by our sin. But God is a better and a good and a greater God who identifies us not by what we've done, but what he has done for us. So I'm probably out of time. You might imagine by now I could talk for hours and you don't even have half the story at this point. But what I hope you have is a perspective that people who struggle with this issue are still God's kids who he is waiting to come home. And unless we share and meet them in that journey and allow, allow us as the church to be used as his hands and feet to bring people home, you know, they're, they're not going to get there. I love the ministry of Portland Fellowship. It helped me learn what was wrong and how to address it. But you know where my greatest healing came? The body of Christ from men and women who just purposed to love me and walk alongside me and meet the needs that never got met to provide safe places for me to cry and to grieve and to experience victory, who encouraged me to be more like Jesus and did not disqualify me because my sin was different than theirs. So I have the joy now of sharing this testimony around the country and sharing what God can do through a life redeemed. Thanks for listening. I feel like our service today has been a little unusual, not your typical kind of service and message maybe. 
And I really hope <clears throat> that you've got something out of this today. As a pastor, one of the visions for our church is that we would be a safe place. Anybody want to say amen to that? Uh, a safe place so that people can get healed. That's a passion in my heart. Now we're going to take up an offering in a minute, and I want to encourage you to come back tonight. If you didn't get a... We've got some questions after. Maybe you didn't have questions when he started, but maybe you've got some questions now. Some things you want to ask. How do I deal with uh, uh, Dolores and I? We have friends, family members who were or are in uh, a lifestyle of sexual brokenness in various ways. Maybe most of the people here have that. I don't know. But uh, <clears throat> we want to be able to... See, the word says that we're all called to the ministry of reconciliation. We want to see everybody reconciled to God, reconciled to the Father through Jesus Christ. Everybody, regardless of what they're in or what they have been in. And so I pray that... Uh, the Holy Spirit downloaded some things in your heart as Drew shared today. Tonight, he's going to share some from more from the Word, really, as a teaching time and question and answer. Because if you're listening to this today, maybe the wheels are turning and you're thinking about that aunt or uncle or cousin or child or whoever that's living in a lifestyle that's broken and, and you're, you just don't know how to reach them. And, and you might have some questions about how to do that. We'll, we'll talk about that tonight and whatever else happens as the Holy Spirit leads. I want to encourage you to come out tonight. We'll be in the back room and it'll be more of a casual occasion. But uh, before we take up the offering, I just, I just want to have us bow our heads. And I just want to ask if, if you're here today and you feel like the Holy Spirit. Homosexual struggle. And what I didn't share this morning, which would probably give a little bit more context to why I get to actually teach on this issue, is that um, after struggling through this, uh, this struggle myself, finding a discipleship program and, and beginning to experience great healing, um, like what happens with many people in testimony is that when the Lord transforms your life, you want to kind of give back the same hope you've been given. And so after spending several years uh, in ministry, receiving ministry from the Ministry of Portland Fellowship in Portland, Oregon, I had the opportunity to join the staff and minister there full time for 11 and a half years. And so I've walked alongside hundreds of men and women who have been in the same position that I have, struggling with their sexual identity, struggling with sexual brokenness, and, and fighting to submit those things to the Lordship of Christ. And so I've seen many, many wonderful transformations as God has taken broken lives and mended them and made them whole. And I've watched many, many people as well struggle and fight to try to have redemption and yet fall back into uh, their formal patterns of sin because that happens with every struggle. And in particular with this struggle, there are some pitfalls and some issues that surround it that make it particularly hard. And so tonight I'm going to share a few of those. Um, but not only in addition to spending 11 and a half years in ministry there, for the last two and a half years, I've been traveling the country, helping equip churches and pastors and organizations to respond to this issue. And um, it's from that platform that I'm going to teach tonight. Uh, having walked with hundreds of men and women, having walked with families who have gay identified and trans identified loved ones who are trying to figure out how to love and relate to their loved ones, and having a loved one of my own who is in this particular life that I have to practice everything I preach with, um, my own identical twin brother who is in partnership with a man, has been for 10 years, and has an adopted four-year-old son with him, it's not theory to me. Nothing that I say tonight, nothing that I've said or will teach on is ever just theory. This is, this is fought for. This is lived out. This is tested and true. 
And so I hope that that gives a little bit more context that I'm not just someone with a testimony. I'm someone who spent the greater part of the last two decades immersed in this redemptive community and have really fought for the truths that I'm going to share tonight. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I want to focus tonight for the teaching portion uh, on two uh, attributes that the church struggles to hold in good balance in regards to this particular issue, and that is truth and love. Because it seems as though culturally we have this tendency to err on one side or the other. And if I think that we look at the church um, culturally and in our time and season with this issue, we can see where there are portions of the church that pull to one side or the other of the spectrum. On the love end of the spectrum, you see a lot of churches that have distorted love to mean permission and approval. And, you know, we see whole denominations that are that are breaking in pieces over the issue of homosexuality. And not a single denomination is immune to this. There are factions in each that are trying to pull that denomination further or, or, or closer to accepting and approving and celebrating this particular issue. Um, and then there are some that are just very ambiguous but just want to remain loving to people and really don't stand for much of anything. And so that's a distortion of love. And on the other side of the spectrum, on that truth spectrum, is we can see that there are churches who act really almost violently in their responses to what they see happening in culture. And they may be quoting scripture, and they may be standing up for biblical truth, but they do so in such an unloving way that it leaves bitterness in the taste of people who see it. Uh, any of you familiar with the apologist Ravi Zacharias? He's an amazing man, an amazing apologist, probably one of the best of our current age. And he um, says something in, in his teachings. He says that, that uh, a, a strong conviction without love, girding it and, and, and flavoring the presentation of that conviction, makes that conviction repulsive to those who hear it. And so I, I see that it's very true in our culture where people stand for the truth, or their definition of love is to boldly scream truth at the opposing side, and it does not draw people to Jesus. It really is a deficit to that conversation. In fact, I will say this, most people on that camp think that if they win the argument, they will win the soul. And in 20 years of being involved in this field of ministry, I have never met a person who came out of homosexuality because they lost an intellectual argument. Not a single one. What I have met is that people leave this particular struggle and surrender this when they have an encounter with the people of God who not only embody the truth of God, but embody the love of Jesus together. Because that's what draws people out of where they are, is an encounter with the, the love of God embodied by people who are accurately representing him. And that's truth and love together. Now, I want to kind of say that one of the ways that we have to approach this and get this issue of truth and love right, it really depends on how we look at three different things. And, and one in particular, which I'll start with, is how we understand the nature and character of God in relation to this struggle and to this issue. Um, the second thing is how we understand a biblical perspective of sexuality. That's really important. And the third is how we understand and relate to people who are dealing with this particular struggle or experiencing sexual brokenness. I'm going to start with God because I think he's the best place to start. I'm glad you laughed on that. That was kind of funny. So um, uh, another apologist and author that is one of my favorites that I've read quite a bit of is A.W. Tozer. I call him Ah Tozer because it just soothes my soul when I read him. And uh, he's written extensively on the character attributes of God. And in his, his writings, the, the attributes of God, he makes this statement, and it, I found it completely prophetic and profound to our current age. It says this, Christianity at any given time is strong or weak depending upon her concept of who God is. I insist upon this and have said it many times that the basic trouble with the church today and the individual Christian is her unworthy conception of God. Did you know we can focus on a true attribute of God, but if we focus on that exclusively to, to the exclusion of the rest, we get a distorted image. And that's truly what's happening in our culture in the church today, is people focus on mercy and love and grace to the exclusion of holiness, righteousness, and judgment. 
and we get a distorted image of God that is being promoted in our culture and given great capacity to endorse and celebrate things that the Bible calls sin. And on the end end of the spectrum, we have the righteous, angry God who is sending hurricanes and terrorist attacks to judge those homosexuals, and it's not accurate to his character. It's absolutely inaccurate to his character. In fact, if we are good students of the Bible, we recognize because Scripture tells us that judgment comes for the unbeliever at the end of time, at the judgment seat of Christ. But here and now, he judges his church and his family first because he judges his legitimate children. He disciplines his legitimate children, not his illegitimate ones. And so if there's any judgment coming through hurricanes or 9-11 or whatever else some Christian out there decided was God's judgment against the homosexuals, biblically that's inaccurate. If we want to claim judgment, we have to claim it as discipline towards the church, not the unbeliever, because it's not their time yet. God is incredibly gracious in dealing with the unsaved and withholding his judgment until an appointed time, but he is notoriously good at disciplining his kids. And so the misrepresentation of that truth, righteous, just God really puts out an image to the world of our God that is inaccurate to his character. Although he is righteous, he is just, he is going to deal with sin, it inaccurately represents him to a world that is dying to understand who he is. That makes sense? So truth and love have to come together because one, to the exclusion of the other, presents a false image and it really creates a, a deception about the character and heart of God. You know, likewise, if we weigh on the side of truth and kind of weigh on this, on this place of, of judgment and righteousness, what eventually begins to happen is we become very aggressive as a Christian community. And with aggression comes a lack of grace. We don't have patience for people in their brokenness. And what breeds out of that is a tendency to fear. And I think you see that in our church today. We see the things happening in our culture, in our world, and we're not responding out of confidence. I mean, a very specific example are every business out there who might feel threatened by the gay marriage issue. And it's not that that's not a legitimate issue. It's not that there's not actual things happening threatening people of faith who own businesses. But how we respond, if it's based in fear, is not from the Lord. We know that 2 Timothy 1.7 says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of truth and of a sound mind. And so we know that if we're responding out of fear as a Christian community, we're not responding from the Holy Spirit. We're not responding from the Spirit of God. We are responding from a place of reaction and a carnal place of of fear-based misunderstanding of God's heart and character. But when we breed that fear, when we breed that lack of grace, what we end up becoming is very legalistic. We start looking at people's sins and we develop a checklist of what's acceptable and unacceptable walking through the doors of our church and even in our own families. That breeds this marginalization that happens with us where we start really categorizing what sins are more acceptable and tolerable and what sins really are threatening to our communities. And we lose perspective about the process God takes us in in discipleship and sanctification. Like I was sharing this morning, Why is it that my sin in that list that everyone can find ourselves in, why was it that that sin was so repugnant that I didn't believe I could even come to God for mercy, and yet almost any other list in that, sin in that list, we would welcome into our churches and disciple them without a second thought. That breeds, therefore, self-righteousness within the church. And let me tell you, nothing turns off the world like self-righteousness. See, the world has this radar for hypocrisy. They see it, and they call it out. And we as the church get a little frustrated when they call out our hypocrisy, but the world has every right to do that. We are claiming to know God, and we are claiming to be supernaturally changed and people of love. The world is not making such a claim. They can behave any old way they want to because they're making up their own rules, but we have a set of rules that we are saying we're ascribing to, and when we don't, they are right to point out the hypocrisy. It's an uncomfortable thing to allow ourselves to be discipled by the pagan world. But sometimes it happens. So, please don't hear me say that the truth isn't important. Please don't hear me marginalize the truths that that are at the root of a lot of our responses. I believe in holy matrimony. I believe in the inerrancy of scripture. I believe 
in absolutely everything that people feel threatened in our culture today. I believe in religious liberty. I want us to be able to make our own choices of ours a business to be able to choose whether or not to serve at a particular, a particular customer, specifically based on what challenges our faith and convictions. Don't hear me say that these truths aren't important. They are absolutely important. I have laid my life down for the truths that we are dealing with today. And I will tell you this, probably one of the first people to be sent off to prison, if this ever gets to that point, is me, because I'm talking loudly about my testimony all the time around the country. And I know that if I were to go in certain parts of this world, I would be thrown in jail for the testimony that I share. And it's not that far out if we keep going the way that we are. Nevertheless, God has not given us a spirit of fear. And I will still proclaim the truths I know because these truths are very important. It's just in how we present them and how we live them out in how we engage these truths and embody them that matters so incredibly importantly to this issue. On the other side of the spectrum, we, like we talked about that love side or the love side, this particular brand of love breeds passivity in the Christian church, a, a non-reaction, a sense that, and I've heard this said by so many people of my generation and below, I don't need to preach at them, I just need to love them. I just need to love them into the kingdom. Well, what does that even mean? Like, unless you are telling someone, I, if my child is in the, in the street, playing in the street, I don't just say, I love you. I go over and I tell them, you're going to get killed to get out of the street. Because it's not loving to sit back passively and not speak when there's danger or threat. Amen? Amen. So this love side becomes passive. And, and, it, and what happens is that breeds this cheap grace. This cheap grace issue, which if you want to read more about that, read Dietrich Bonhoeffer in The Cost of Discipleship. He'll tell you all about it. But it's, it's, a, it's an issue that's faced the church for millennia of this cheap, ridiculous grace that says, you know, I don't care about how I behave. That doesn't matter because the grace of God is going to cover it all. Well, the grace of God <laughs> enables us to live beyond our sin, not enables us to continue sinning. So that cheap grace produces immaturity in the body of Christ. It produces this carnal Christian that is moved by their inclinations and their desires, not by the truth of God and not by the Spirit of God. And then what we see is there's no transformation happening in people's lives because when you don't submit to the Spirit, you don't change. You know, Ravi Zacharias said it again. He said one of the greatest apologetic questions he faces as an apologist to the world is if we claim to be a supernatural people group, why is there not more evidence of supernatural transformation in our lives? And it's a big problem in the church. That resistance to transformational power is a resistance to sanctification. And then what happens when you resist the Spirit of God is you begin viewing the commandments of Scripture that are meant to disciple us as negative and restrictive and bad. So we resist God and we start negatively viewing his commandments. And the next natural progression is that not only do we view those commandments as negative, but we start celebrating the opposite as godly and good. And the word of God warns us that people will be calling evil good and good evil. And that does happen. And it's something we're facing. If you doubt that, just go into one of these churches and try to, con you know, or one of this, someone who's in this realm and just try to confront some sin in their life. Now you're horrible and judgmental, and how dare you do that? Jesus would never do that. And I have to wonder, what Jesus are you reading? Because he confronted sin all the time, but he did it in love. So it's not one or the other. It has to be both together. So that being said, we have to view God as a total understanding, a full view of his character, because if we weigh love on this side or truth on this side, we're going to get a distortion either way. We have to understand that those two do not stand in conflict with one another. They are beautifully matched, and they, they are perfect in their balance. Another thing we have to wrestle with is this, this theological issue of the sovereignty of God. Now, let me ask you this, and I do need responses here. Do we believe that God is sovereign? Okay, we do. We believe he's sovereign, which means that he is in control. He's in charge. We also know that in the scripture it says that he is the one who raises up people of influence and power, saying he's the one who raises up kings, he's the one who gives influence. We understand that, correct? Do we agree? Good biblical people. Yes, we agree. God is the one in charge. He is the one who raises up power and influence. Let me ask you a theological question. If we believe that God is in charge and God is the one who raises up people of power and influence, 
then why does such a small portion of our population have so much power and influence over us now? And even in the church. If we are to believe our very words and convictions, then we have to conclude that it is God who has given the gay community their influence and power. Now, why would God do that? Let me, let me pose it to you this way. I was listening to a, a man who had come out of, of a Muslim background. And he, um, he you know, was a college student when he gave his life to Jesus. He lost his entire family. He you know, experienced some great, great loss at the hands of, of following Jesus. And as he was sharing his testimony, he made this comment. He said, you know, for the last 45 years, the U.S. has been sending one missionary for every million Muslims. He said, so God got tired of you not wanting to come to them, so he's sending them to you. Now let me ask you this. What are the two demographics that the church is struggling to know how to engage with in our current world that seem like an assault against our very way of life? Radical Islam and the LGBTQ community. I will say this boldly, that God has put this particular small portion of the population with, an, with incredible cultural influ influence and political control in our world because he is, God is sick and tired of the church ignoring them and allowing them to just go ahead and die and go to hell without caring about their eternal resting place, where they go. There are good, wonderful, lovely people who God wants to redeem and turn into the next Paul, into the next Peter, into the next whoever in that community, and they are not saved, not because God isn't willing and God isn't powerful, but because his hands and feet won't get up and go to them and won't engage. We have been afraid of that community. We've been disgusted by that community. We've, we've pointed out their calamity and been glad saying it's God. And what we haven't done is love them well. And I'm, gonna, I'm here to tell you God is not allowing his church to not behave like his church. You see, God has a history, and you can read about it in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God has a well-established history that when his people are not behaving like his people, he will put pagan, ungodly people in influence and power over his people. You call it exile in the Old Testament. You can call it Rome in the New. It doesn't matter what you call it. God will put hardship and difficulty and persecution on his people as discipline until we begin to learn what it truly is to follow Jesus. And I'm sorry, but persecution is not what we're feeling right now. This is a light, small potatoes compared to what we could. And quite frankly, I, I feel very compelled to tell the church, let's get on board with God's plan before it gets worse. Amen? Okay, well, I'm glad I have you all on board on that. Maybe not all of you are on board, but that's okay. God wants us to represent him well, and he is not content when we don't. And, and here is the thing. If we are not behaving like his people, it's not just in the way that we interact with, with the gay community. We're also somewhat hypocritical in our own communities. And I can say this with pretty, pretty well-established authority. I've been working in sexual brokenness ministry for 20 years. And as I shared in my testimony today, whenever I share my testimony, everyone tells me everything about theirs because somehow I've kicked the door open for confession. And so I can't tell you how many people in the church, Bible college students, seminary graduates, pastors, missionaries, constantly will tell me of their struggles with sexuality, their failures in sexuality. And yet we constantly are preaching an ethic that we don't know how to hold. And when we then as this broken church stand in judgment of the world who claims no such conviction and lives out their own life and what they feel is right, not claiming to be convicted over this issue, and we point at them and say, sinner, we have four fingers pointing at us as the body and we need to deal with what Jesus said, take the log out of our own eye first. Not because we have no place to speak into culture, not because we have no place to speak to the world, but as Jesus himself said it, take the log out of your own eye first so that you can see clearly to remove the speck from your brothers. 
You can't pull a person out of a ditch that you're not out of yourself. We cannot minister from a place of hypocrisy. And so if we want a redemptive voice of sexuality in our culture, we have to be sexually redeemed people. We on board with that? Let's talk about sex. (laughs) I said that so casually. I resisted saying, let's talk about sex, baby, let's talk about... And that's this old song from my era, but some of you... Anyway, so sex. Um, I can sum up the, the breadth and width of the teaching on sexuality that I received in all my years of church and in four years of Bible college in one word. Does anyone want to guess it? I think abstinence is a fancy way of saying the word that I was thinking of, and the word I think of is don't. (laughs) Yeah. It's amazing to me, as someone who goes and speaks on sex all the time, how little the church addresses it. It's amazing to me because it is such a fundamental piece of who we are, Not, not having sex, but the fact that we are all sexual beings, we all are a product of a sexual union, we all have genders that are distinctly sexual in nature, that God has consistently used sexual themes in Scripture to teach us things, that the consistent, most consistent analogy in Scripture is the marital analogy between God and his bride, whether it be Israel or his church, and that the Bible starts with two people naked in a garden, and their first command is, go have babies, And it has that union, that marriage of Adam and Eve together. The analogies of sexuality go all throughout the scripture, and the scripture ends with the marriage feast of the Lamb and his bride, and it's marriage and sexuality all throughout the scriptures, and we maybe devote one sermon, or if we're lucky, a series of a couple weeks to the topic, and absolutely, in my my understanding and, and my knowledge, no Bible college gives more than maybe one hour maybe of teaching to this issue for people preparing for ministry. And yet it is one of the single largest struggles that pastors are facing with their congregations, sexual issues, that next to money, and there's no training. There's no theological teaching on sexuality that's consistent and biblical and life-giving beyond don't. And do you know where that comes from, that don't? Do you all know who St. Augustine is, or Augustine, however you want to pronounce it, depending on your flavor? So Augustine slash Augustine is one of the people, the theologians, that came up with the concept of original sin um, and promoted that idea of the total depravity of man, which finds its roots in Calvinism. But his belief, which informed those things, is that every sexual act is sinful. Absolutely every sexual act. Doesn't matter if you're married. Doesn't matter if you are, like, holy matrimony, you have sex and that's a sinful act and that sexual union is how original sin is passed forward, so all sex is sinful. St. Augustine was a sex addict in his history and he had a very difficult time overcoming this particular addiction, so his woundedness informed his theology, which has informed all of church theology since. So even though maybe we don't believe that all sexual unions are sinful, that influence has affected the church for a millennia, where the Catholic Church in medieval times would teach, you know, you don't get to have sex except for these certain days of the year and only to procreate, and then that fed into the idea that any, like, non-procreative sex was sinful, and then we don't talk about anything, like, really about that other than, like, don't, 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 and then if you're married, go, which is a really interesting gear change. Somehow there's this weird teaching and the lack of teaching is like, if you wait to have sex till you're married, then once you do get married and have sex, everything is going to be amazing and perfect. How many of you are married? How many of you know that ain't true? It's amazing to me. My wife and I have done premarital counseling for quite a few couples, and we met this couple a couple years back who were both like the epitome of virginal purity. Like... They have never done every, anything with anyone ever before, never been defiled by any pornographic anything, never even seen like a scandalous scene in a movie. They, that, like, they were the pure as the driven snow. If anyone would be the test case that their marriage should have been blissful into that wedding night, it would have been them. But the problem was when they did have their first night, they called us while on their honeymoon and they said, we feel so dirty and so guilty. 
because no one ever taught them the goodness of sexuality. The only thing they were ever taught is don't. And that is a really difficult gear change for people with no lack of, no, no, no breadth of teaching on the goodness or the parable of sexuality and, and what God has built into it as, as good and right. And so they, they felt guilty. And I'll tell you this, one of the reasons why we are struggling to hold on to the younger generation in the church in the issue of sexuality is not because the Bible isn't true and not because, you know, there's not something for us to say. It's that we have built our entire teaching based on what we are against, not what we are for. And the argument against is never as powerful as the argument for. And the world has plenty of arguments for. They may be wrong and they may be sinful and they may be selfish, but they are there. And that's more powerful than don't. So when we say, don't do that, that's sin, and they say, but justice. But how can we withhold something that, from someone that is part of their humanity? Justice says we must enable it. Well, but don't. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? There was a church in San Francisco... It was a reformed Christian church. It was one of the largest evangelical churches in, in California and in the Bay Area. And they had a very conservative Christian ethic on sexuality for a number of years. Unfortunately, it was mainly based on the don't idea. It wasn't a, a developed theology on sexuality. And so they were calling people to, anyone who struggled with homosexuality, it's like, you must be celibate for your whole life. Don't. No healing in that. No life, no hope. Just don't. And I understand don't sexually sin, but there has to be somewhere you're going. You know, it can't just be, you know, step out of that prison cell into this one and good luck. That's not life-giving, and that's not the gospel. The gospel is life abundant, not don't. And so they were telling people celibacy, 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 not addressing any of the issues in their hearts. And, of course, what was happening in San Francisco was they're getting a lot of people in their church, and this was a damaging teaching because they weren't addressing the wounds of their hearts. They weren't giving them any place to grow from there, and inevitably people were struggling and and lonely and depressed, and, and it was producing some, some damage in their church. And so they overreacted, and they changed their entire doctrinal statement, and they said, we are no longer going to restrict people from being members in our church based on their sexuality. We kicked the doors wide open because we have found that telling people to not engage in their sexual orientation is causing harm and is restricting human flourishing. Therefore, we give people permission now let me ask you this, while well, they say this, they did not make any caveat of what kind of sexual orientation was acceptable. They just said that to restrict people from acting on their sexual orientation was causing obvious harm and lacking human flourishing, so they were going to throw that out. Well, I certainly hope they have something to say when a pedophile comes into their church. Or any of the other sexual deviations. You know, you don't want me to list them all. They're... You know, there's a lot of them, and they're all outside the will of God. And yet, when you kick that door open to include an argument for something like inclusion or justice or human flourishing, devoid of the scriptural commandments and their understanding, you're arguing for, so you're going to win people. And the argument against or against something is not going to hold much power. We have to know what we're fighting for. We have to know something better than don't. And we have to have a better story than that. And, I'm, and I will say this to you. I don't have time to give you that full theology right now because I have a lot of other things I want to say. Maybe, maybe Lionel will bring me back someday and I'll teach that one because it is, it, it's really important for us to know. I'll give you a sneak peek. It's a little one. Let me ask you this. Do we all ab agree and believe that we are all created in the image of God? Men and women created in his image, right? Is God a body? No, he's a spirit. But we have bodies, yes? And men and women are different, correct? You better believe it. We are different bodily, but the word says that we bear his image. Well, it must be that men and women bear his image differently, and something about our bodies must be revealing of the nature of God. It's like God to teach in parable, isn't it? In fact, even parable that isn't spoken parable, in Romans it says that God's invisible attributes have been displayed throughout nature so that no one has excuse to not know the attributes and character of God because he puts them all throughout creation. 
And if he says that we bear his image and we're unique in our image bearing ness as men and women, then women, you reveal something about the nature of God that men don't. And men, you reveal something about the nature of God and the image of God that women don't. And together in that picture, united, we display a full picture of his character. Not separate, but together. And even in our bodily form, there's something of a parable in the shape of our bodies and how they match together. And how the act of sex, and I'm saying a lot of things in church we don't normally talk about, but the act of sex is parable. I'll put it to you this way. What are we called as the church? We are the body of Christ, and we are the bride of Christ. Male and female, correct? Well, men, you are designed in a very particular way. We all know it. I don't have to say it. Very differently than women. And in the act of sex, we know how that goes, correct? Do I have to explain it to anybody here? We all know how it goes. A woman is open to be entered, and a man enters her. That's what the actual literal Hebrew words for male and female describe. And we know that as the bride of Christ, Christ enters our hearts and implants life in us, correct? We nourish that life of Christ in us. This is why when Christ said to the Pharisees, your attempts at righteousness are like filthy rags. Literal translation of filthy rags is menstrual cloths. Jesus said it, so I can too. And what that picture was saying is, if we were to get beyond just the words and understand the meaning, it's saying your attempt at righteousness only reveals that there's no life in you because when a woman has a period, she is not pregnant with life. There's no life growing in her. Essentially saying, no life of God is alive in you and growing. Because as the bride, we receive Christ and we grow the life of Christ in us. As the bride, we receive people in and we help nourish their lives in Christ. Correct? The revelation says the spirit and the bride say, come, we are invitational as the bride. Therefore, anyone should be able to come in and learn about Jesus and we should help them learn who he is. We should be not afraid of anyone, whatever they look like, walking into the doors of our churches because this is not the temple, this is. Right? So we are all feminine because we are all the bride but we are all masculine because we are his body. In the body of Christ, Christ himself is incarnational. He comes down and enters in to our world first. Christ came out of heaven and entered into earth as flesh. He made his dwelling among us. He brought the heart of God to us in a tangible way. He was incarnational, stepping out of that perfect relationship and into chaos coming out away from the home of his mother and father to be united with his bride. Ephesians 5, which is why Paul says, this is a profound mystery, and I'm saying it refers to Christ and his bride. Genesis 2, Ephesians 5, it's all pointing back to that relationship. But as the body of Christ, we are also incarnational because we don't just sit in here and wait for them to come to us. We go out into chaos and we find people and we take the life of Christ to them too. And we implant the life of Christ into people and communities because we are incarnational. And all of this ties to sex. Because that's the analogy God chose to display that reality of who he is and who we are. And that intimacy and that reproduction and everything that comes with sexuality is all pointing back to a deeper spiritual reality that we lose the meaning of because somewhere along the lines in Protestantism, we decided marriage wasn't a sacrament. And what a sacrament is, is a specific thing, a specific tangible thing that points to a divine truth. We believe in baptism, but somehow marriage isn't a sacrament. And yet it is the greatest one. That's just a preview. So, stay tuned for more. We have to also understand about sexuality that sexuality is, although... All sin separates us from God equally. Sexuality carries with it different consequences than other sins, which is why the Apostle Paul said sexual sin is different. So, perfect example, I shared this morning, I have a lot of experience with, with stealing cookies from cookie jars and any other sweet things from any other place. My children, unfortunately, know that Halloween candy has to be labeled because I will eat it. My wife actually solved this problem this year by making me my own bag of candy, saying, this is yours, leave the kids alone, because I will take their Kit Kats. I love them. And their Reese's peanut butter cups. I love those too. I have no self-control in that regard. Um, 
But I know how to make that sin right. I can go out and I can buy new candy. I can apologize. I can own my sinful behavior. I can repent. God will forgive me. My kids will eventually forgive me. And really, there's not a lot of consequence to that sin. If I tell a lie to someone, it might have some consequence, but I can own the truth. I can repent and deal with the temporary consequences from it. If I go out and rape someone, I can't take that back. That stays. The memory will stay. If I get someone pregnant out of wedlock, that's a consequence. An eternal consequence. That child is going to be, it's an eternal being. That's a consequence. If I sin sexually with pornography, which I have experience with, uh, Jesus has forgiven me. He's washed my spirit clean. He has not given me amnesia, no matter how much I wish he did. And I have a really good memory, a freakishly good memory. I remember things from when I was one years old, very clearly. I, I, unfortunately, it works really good for scripture memorization and a lot of other things. It's also very detrimental with all the sexual defilement I've experienced in my life. It doesn't go away. It's all in the file cabinet. That will stay with me. And consequently as well, sexual sin heterosexually and sexual sin in that regard is different than homosexual sin or transsexual sin. So, for example, if you have a heterosexual couple that come to your church and they're living in sin and they're coming here and God convicts them of that sin, they can repent and they can submit their relationship to the Lordship of Christ and they can get married and they can move on forward in their relationship, and they really don't lose much but a little bit of time and self-gratification. And really, a lot of churches might even bear with for a little while until they get married, saying, well, we know they're going to get married, so let's just not confront it because it'll fix itself, as if that actually fixes it. That's a whole other sermon, too. But if a gay couple comes to your church, let's say a gay couple like my twin brother and his partner, Will, who have been together for a decade, who have adopted a son and are going to be adopting another child here in the next year, who have a mortgage together and an entire community that they have surrounded themselves and their whole identities are based on their sexuality. And absolutely everything is wrapped up in this. If they come to your church and Jesus convicts them of their sin, do you have any idea how much they're going to lose if they obey? They're going to lose their identity. They're going to lose their relationship. They're going to lose every financial decision that they put together, they're going to lose everything. They're going to leave a community who is going to hate them for their betrayal. And they're going to lose their friendships. They're going to lose everything. And if one partner isn't repentant and the other one is, they might lose their child forever. I've seen this happen for one meeting a week with all of you. And sometimes in churches where people really don't want that kind of person in their church. And aren't that loving to that person. It has been said so many times in my history ministering to people, it is easier to find sex in the gay community than it is a hug in church. I'm not lying to you. With technology the way that it is, any person in any community, in that gay community, who wants to have sex can get on their phone and have an anonymous hookup within the next 10 minutes. That is the reality. And yet they come and they surrender everything and they walk into a church where some people don't want to hug them. And some people won't trust them. When I was walking out of this, I I wasn't even really deep into the life. And I was years out of it. And I was going to a church and I was honest with people about where I was. And I was, you know, trying to gain some friendships. And I saw a guy in our church who was a little bit younger than me and he was really kind of No one really was his friend. He was about 350 pounds and smelled bad. And he was like, you know, he just just wasn't the kind of person that invited a lot of friendship. But I saw him, and I knew what it was like to feel rejected and alone. And so I thought, you know what, I want to be his friend because I don't want anyone to feel rejected and alone. And so I struck up a friendship with him. And his mother confronted me two weeks into our friendship in the lobby of our church saying, I don't trust you with my son. What if you try to seduce him? I'm like, woman, I have standards. That was a joke. But only a little bit of a joke, you know? It's like, 
I, I was so honest about where I was at and I was seeking the Lord and I was involved in ministry and I had accountability all around me. And even then, the most ridiculous distrust was, was there. And I'll, I'll tell you the truth. If I was not so tenacious and committed to walking with the body of Christ, I would have left that church and never gone back simply on that statement that was so ridiculous and judgmental and uncaring. Like, it wasn't, thank you for being my son's friend. He doesn't have any friends. No, it was, are you going to seduce him? No. No. If I wanted to go out and have a gay relationship, I'm living in Portland. I could find it somewhere else. So it really, I've seen so many people, and it breaks my heart for the people I've ministered to. There's been so many people who God has loved and convicted, and they've been trying their best to walk this out. And they leave ministries like the Portland Fellowship, which are just a temporary ministry. It's not the church. It's like a greenhouse. And they go out and they try to implant in the body of Christ, and they have no community willing to receive them. And so just like Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like this, the parable of the sower, seeds are sown, and the thorns choke out the life, or the devil comes and steals it, or there's no place to root, and so the sun comes out and scorches out the life. Because we need each other. Because Christ's only new commandment to us was love each other as I have loved you. Because in James it says pure and undefiled religion is this, to take care of the orphan and the widow in their distress. And I can't think of a better contemporary example than someone leaving homosexuality when their entire community is gone and maybe their lover is gone and they have nothing and no one and here they are vulnerable. And what does God say to do? Love them and take care of them in their distress because they're not going to make it if they don't have that. Does that make sense? Sexual sin with homosexuality is different. I have a dear friend of mine. Her name is Kathy Grace Duncan. She came and spoke at a, a seminar that I did here just a couple weeks back at my church here in Medford. And I love her testimony. It's amazing. She lived for 12 years as Keith. No one would ever have known she was born a woman. So profoundly, like, if you saw pictures, you could not pick her out in a group of people. Literally, I watched people look at the pictures, and they're like, where is she? And then Kathy Grace goes, there I am. And they went, she had male pattern baldness. She was buff. She had a beard. I mean, it was, that was Keith. Kathy Grace, as Keith, came to know Jesus as Keith, was in church for six years before God brought that conviction of, you need to go back to be the woman I made you to be. And then it took another four and a half years after agreeing with God and stopping the hormone treatment before she could pass as a woman again. Not because she was disobedient, but because those were the consequences of her choices. Four and a half years. Church, do we have the grace to bear with someone like that for more than a couple weeks? when their life is not all ordered back together once they repent? Because some consequences take a long time to undo. And if we aren't gracious with that, then we're not going to see people's lives transform. Sexual sin has different consequences. So when you think about that and you think about the people in that community, is it reasonable, at least in understanding, why it would be so difficult for someone to agree with God in this? Because I'll tell you what, I never asked for my feelings and I never asked for my struggles. And I had a whole world telling me it was impossible to overcome them. Basically, the message from the world is nothing is more powerful than your sexuality, not even God himself. And I certainly did experience for years in praying and asking God to remove these attractions from me that they didn't happen until I just began to obey and walk in obedience and faith with him. And then those things slowly dismantled. But can you imagine... How overwhelming it would seem for someone for that community to come into a community where they're saying everything you know to be true, everything that comes naturally to you, everything that you are inclined towards, you now need to surrender. And a lot of us, when we come to Jesus, Jesus we add on to our already existing life, and it doesn't change that much. And we might even throw a little bit of a fit if he starts messing with our established life. Can we have more compassion for that community and understanding why it's so difficult and why there's so much resistance and so much of a movement to try to justify that life because the thought of trying to dismantle it is so incredibly overwhelming. 
and so incredibly hard and so incredibly countercultural. And even half the church now is affirming that they don't even have to try. When we look at the LGBTQ community, we really have to keep in mind who they are and where they're at because there's, there's a couple different types of people. We can't lump them all in together. So number one, I would say that there are people that are struggling with same-sex attraction but agree with the word of God. If you find someone like that, celebrate their journey. They are heroes for trying to go countercultural in a world that is trying to tell them they have every right to indulge in this. And if they are submitting it to the Lordship of Christ and allowing the Lord to determine their identity and walking in faith that God will be good and, and faithful to his word to give them a life of abundance, even if it means singleness for the rest of their life, we had better as a church get on board with those people and love them well and try to meet absolutely every need that they have because they're not going to make it otherwise. And we should not be afraid of them. We should be linking arms with them because their burden is heavy. Okay? Now I'm getting a little bit passionate about that one. The second one is people that I would call practicing and proclaiming. That's a phenomenon we're seeing where there are people that are claiming a gay identity and behavior, and they're also proclaiming that they are Christian. This is the category my twin brother falls into. And this is really a difficult category because we have to debate or have to engage in the scriptural misunderstandings when we engage in that. But what I will say is... <sighs> What we have to do as the church is we have to establish where we are as churches, know what our convictions are, and be willing to stand on them even if it causes some pain relationally. I love my twin brother and I love his partner, but I do not have Christian fellowship with them. I can't. Do I have relational connection with them? Yes. He's my twin brother. I'm not getting rid of him. And plus, if I were to just discard him because of his sin... He's just going to you know, get himself in a community that is an echo chamber and tells him everything he wants to hear. There will be no voice of conviction. There will be no presence of annoyance to confront his life. And I am committed to being an annoyance. And that means it's very uncomfortable for me and there are lines and boundaries that I have to draw and there are things that I do not get to do in relationship with him. But I am committed to being in relationship with him, not in Christian fellowship. And that's a hard distinction for me, but it's an important one. See, for me, even though he claims a Christian identity, I had to come to terms with the fact that not everyone who calls themselves a Christian is actually in relationship with Jesus, right? Because sitting in a church does not make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. And so we have to understand that what it means to be a Christian and a follower of Jesus is different than casually saying, oh, I believe in Jesus. Well, the Bible says even the demons believe in shudder, so good for you. Are you surrendering your life to Jesus? And where do you stand in those convictions? So with that community, I stand not to try to force them into my beliefs, but to stand as a witness that contradicts their statements and who is lovingly inviting them back to the truth. Does that make sense? I have the right and authority because they call themselves brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ to confront their belief system and say, you're not conforming to what the Bible says. It gets a little hard. It gets a little difficult to do. And often people don't want to relate to you in that regard because it's uncomfortable. But that's my commitment. I have to call them to obedience. They don't have to listen to me, but I have to do what I have to do. But then there's the secular, pagan, non-believing, homosexual person. And I am not called to call them into repenting of their behavior. I'm called to demonstrate Jesus to them. I want to tell you a story quickly, and then we're going to do question and answer. I have no idea about how late we're going to go, but I imagine it'll... Well, anyway, you'll, just, you'll eventually all just leave, and I'll still be talking, but that's okay. <laughs> Years ago, when I was an intern at the Ministry of Portland Fellowship, I was working at a Starbucks in downtown Portland, and I called it my little lesbian Starbucks because I was the only guy that worked there, and all the women that worked there were lesbians. It was a very interesting work environment. You know, a lot of caffeine and a lot of lesbians first thing in the morning. That's, that's a joke. Okay, thank you for laughing at that. Um, but one day I was working in the back room, filling out some paperwork or something, and the assistant manager came into the back room, and she looked at me. She said, so you're a Christian, huh? And I said, oh, no. And I said, yes, yes, I'm a Christian. 
And she looked at me square in the eyes and she said, do you believe I'm going to hell because I'm gay? And I thought, welcome to Starbucks, Drew. <laughs> and I prayed. I was like, Lord Jesus, help me with this. Holy Spirit, I call on you right now for the wisdom, the eternal wisdom, the voice of wisdom. Speak to my soul right now in the name of Jesus. And I looked at her and I said, no, I don't think you're going to hell because you're gay. And she said, you don't? I said, no, you're going to hell for a lot of reasons. <laughs> And as I stared at her and she stared at me, I thought, you failed me, Holy Spirit. You know, <laughs> I called out to you. You did not give me wisdom. Like, and I'm thinking, someone's going to die today, you know. And, and I sat there, and it felt like an eternity. And she looked at me, she, she goes, what? And I said, I think I may have misspoke. And she goes, you think? And I said, yes. And I said, you're not going to hell for a lot of reasons. She goes, okay, good. I said, but you are going to hell. And I thought, shut up, Drew. Why are you talking? <laughs> and she said, what? And I said, well, you're, you're a Buddhist, right? She had this big Buddha hanging from her. I said, well, yeah. But by the way, even Buddhists don't believe that homosexuality is a, is a proper life. So there's so much. No major religion basically endorses homosexual behavior but the watered-down versions that are popular versions that a lot of people are into, they don't even care. So I said, you're a Buddhist. And she said, well, yeah. And I said, in Christian theology, the only thing that sends a person to hell is that they are not reconciled to God the Father through Christ his Son. I said, Erica, is Jesus your Savior? And she said, no, I'm Buddhist. And, she, and I said, well, in my belief, that's why you're headed to hell. And she just looked at me, and I said, let me clarify. Heterosexual people don't go to heaven, and homosexual people don't go to hell. Redeemed people go to heaven, and unredeemed people go to hell. I said, it has nothing to do with your sexuality. And she stared at me, mouth wide open, and then tears began to fill her eyes, and just streaming down her face, and she said, so it's not just because I'm gay. I said, no. She just wiped her eyes. She goes, okay, I can accept that answer. And she walked out. And then I passed out. <laughs> now, I want to ask you this question. Why did she believe that homosexuality was going to send her to hell? Because the church told her that. Because somehow, and I've experienced this, that when pastors long ago or even Christians quote Leviticus 18.22, which is stated, do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is an abomination. Clearly stating that action is an abomination. How it's often quoted is, don't lie with a man as one lies with a woman. You are an abomination. You see, God understands the difference between our behavior and our personhood. Often we don't. And when I said to her, when I, when I addressed the question for her, it was interesting. God gave me some insight into this, that she wasn't actually asking whether or not I believed homosexuality was a sin. She knew that as a Christian, I believed that. What she was really asking was, did I believe in a God that was going to send her to hell for something she felt like she had no choice in? Because in her worldview, her lesbianism, her homosexuality is an unchosen, unchangeable thing. And if I were to repeat back to her, yeah, your homosexuality is sending you to hell, then what I'm saying to her is, I believe in a God who's going to send you to hell for something you have no choice in. What kind of God is that? Instead, I got to tell her the truth. I believe in a God who loves you and wants to reconcile you to himself. And you can choose that reconciliation or not. It has nothing to do with your sexuality. So I believe in a God that gives you a choice in the matter. Now, whether or not she ever believes in this God or even believes what I believe is true, it's not so much if it's true. It's do I believe in a God that would condemn her for nothing, that she can do anything about. I was able to accurately represent God to her in that moment. And weeks later, she says to me, Drew, why do Christians hate gay people? I mean, we're, we're making mochas on the bar in the morning rush, 
I'm like, this is not the time. But she's like, why do Christians hate gay people? And I said, they don't hate gay people. She said, you lying. I've seen them. And you know what? Our Starbucks was on the parade route. The gay pride parade had just passed. And of course, with every gay pride parade comes those well-meaning Christians who have their signs. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Oh, thank you. I didn't know all better. Because, you know, clearly picket signs and megaphones are going to change hearts. They never do. But she had seen this venom come from the Christian community, and she said, they hate us. And I said, well, I don't think people who accurately represent the heart of Jesus are actually going to do that to you. I think we can tell you what we believe, but I don't think we're going to shout at you and condemn you. I think we're actually going to try to have conversation with you. I said, so I just want to apologize for my brothers and sisters in Christ who have made you feel condemned rather than loved. I said, so that's not an accurate representation of God, so I apologize for that. I said, but I will say this. If you really want to understand why there's this division and why there's this, this frustration between our communities, it's because you are trying to get us to affirm as your identity a behavior that we believe is pulling you away from God. And Erica, I cannot affirm that identity. You are more than what you do sexually. You are a woman created in the image of God whom he loves and wants relationship with. You are more than who you have sex with. And she again cried. And she said, well, okay, I guess I understand that. And we moved on. Two months later, we were having another conversation. And she goes, Drew, my girlfriend and I have been reading some books and we're getting a little worried. And I said, what? She goes, yeah. I mean, really, it's messing us up quite a bit. We're reading these books and we're getting really, really, really concerned about, you know, the afterlife and everything. And I said, what books are you reading? She goes, they're called Left Behind. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I wish you'd be reading the Bible, but I'll work with what I've got, you know, and I thought, okay. And she goes, are we really going to get left behind? And I said, I'm more of a pan-trib kind of guy. And she said, what does that mean? I said, it'll all pan out. <laughs> and, and she's like, well, that does not give me comfort. And I'm like, well, you know, I already told you you're going to hell, so what do you want from me? And she laughed, and because uh, that was a relationship we had. I said, like, well, you're going to hell, so... And she goes, well, but honestly, like, I feel like we really need to be in relationship with Jesus. I was like, oh, what is happening? You know? And I was like, that's a good idea. She goes, well, I think we ought to start going to church. I said, that's an even better idea. And she goes, I think we're going to go to a church that tells us that homosexuality is okay. I said, bad idea. <laughs> and she said, well, why? And I said, well, here's the thing, Erica. Churches that affirm that are changing 2,000 years of understanding of the Bible in this particular area, to fit their own agenda. I said, and I understand. I said, but, but essentially they're, they're warping the truth on this issue. And she goes, well, okay. And I said, if they're warping the truth there, how can you ever trust anything that comes out of their mouths? And she just looked at me and went, oh, crap. <laughs> and I said, I know, right? Yeah. And then the heart of the matter came out. And she said, but I don't want to go somewhere where they're going to reject me. I said, I know. I really know that feeling. I said, but you're in Portland. There are churches here. You wouldn't be the first lesbian to go to some of the churches here. You wouldn't be the first person in a same-sex relationship to walk through the doors of some of these churches. And I know several that will tell you the truth and will love you where you're at. Because you know what, church? Maybe her sexuality is not the first thing on God's priority list. Maybe he wants to win her trust first. Maybe going into church is just her walking towards her father on that journey of the prodigal coming home. I was in church for two years before I confessed my sin. I've known people who've come to church with their partners and been in church for years before God convicted them of their relationship. And they were in churches where they're being consistently taught the truth of God, and the truth of the word, and yet consistently being told, you don't have to agree with us for us to love you and invite you in, but this is what we teach. No, you don't get to be in leadership because you don't agree with what we teach. 
But you've got to be part of our community because we don't require everyone in our community to completely agree with us. And after years, one couple in particular, a lesbian couple, I, that I know their story pretty well, one lesbian lover was the, was the one who gave her other lesbian lover her first Bible in this little Methodist church in, in, in the South where this community loved them and taught them the truth, did not give them leadership, but invited them to Bible study, did not give them the right to teach, but gave them the right to be involved in small groups, just loved them consistently. One of the women finally got to a place where she was convicted, and she surrendered her life. And that woman ended up being the head of the sexuality and gender department of Focus on the Family. Has a doctorate in theology is a wonderful woman. Years in church. Because this is not the temple. And the sinner is welcome here. And so, you know, I share all that to say, like, we, we interact differently with this issue. Whether it's a pagan person, whether it's a person claiming the identity of a, of a Christian and a homosexual, or whether it's someone struggling with this, there's different places. And we have to seek the Holy Spirit to know how to interact with those, those particular people. There's not a formula. And even though we would like to cherry pick some scriptures that give us some idea of what to do, if we look at the whole of the Bible, sometimes those cherry pick scriptures don't match with everything Jesus did. They're in a cultural and historical context that sometimes we don't understand. And we have to fight to understand why in that particular place and reason would Paul say this or would Peter say that. And we have to look at the full witness of, of, of the scripture. Because you know what? Paul does not get to inform Jesus. Jesus gets to inform Paul. Jesus is the authority. Yes. And we understand Paul through Jesus, not the other way around. Does that make sense? Yes. And I love Paul. Don't get me wrong. But I, I know that we have struggled as a church to respond. And sometimes we go to places in scripture that we don't quite fully understand the context and we certainly don't have a love in mind. We have fear. And perfect love casts out fear. Okay. It's the end of my teaching, formal teaching. But I have some questions here that I'm going to read and we're going to answer. Do Anyone can take a break or, or go to the bathroom or grab some more food. I will not be offended. Are you all doing okay? Yeah. Everyone doing okay? Okay. The first question I want to address is pretty simple. It says this. Oh, he's, he's calling a timeout. Because I'm afraid we're going to run out on one CD, so I want to make sure. Oh, we're going to run out on, because I'm so long-winded, we're going to run out on one CD. Um, yes, we, so. let's take a five-minute break. Five-minute break, you can get food or whatever. We've got to switch out the tape because we don't want to run out. Of they have to stop me. I've been known to speak for like, first question that I want to read and then answer is a little bit more simple one. It says this, what statements should be avoided because they're offensive when ministering to or witnessing to someone in the gay lifestyle. Well, I'm going to say right off the bat that the term gay lifestyle is offensive to the gay community. So there's, there's one. Uh, they would not call it a lifestyle. They would call it their identity. And it is somewhat limiting and offensive to them to use the term. Um, I would also say that when we use the words in, in Christianity, love the sinner, hate the sin, that is not translatable to this community because their particular behavior is the basis of their identity. I think my mic is off. Is it off? Do, 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 do. Embrace the cross where Jesus <laughs> Anyway. Um, <clears throat> I like you too. You're my new friend. I'll take you with me on trips. I have a rooting section. Some, some churches are really stoic when I'm teaching them, and it's like, you know how awkward it is already to be talking about sex, but when people are looking at you like this, <laughs> and you're like, I'm going to get no love offerings from this, you know? It's, it was, it's fun. Um, so the, the words, love the sin or hate the sin, are not effective with this community, because for so many, for, for homosexuality, the behavior is part of your identity. And so when, I, when you say to someone, you know, I, I love you, but I hate your sin, you have to understand that identity is based in behavior and attraction. And so essentially what they're hearing is, I hate you. 
And so that's not an effective tool in using for this community or talking about this community. So don't use the word lifestyle. Don't use the words love the sinner, hate the sin. Also, we have to understand, and we get this, that our behavior is a choice. But when we, when we talk about homosexual attraction, we have to understand that nobody chooses their vulnerability. And so when we talk about someone like leaving this or like you can choose to be gay or you can choose to walk out of that, that's, that's not actually an accurate representation of what's going on. You can choose to obey. You can choose to submit your life to Christ, but you don't choose your vulnerabilities or your struggles. And so when we talk about homosexuality in terms of they chose to be gay or they've done this, that's not a real helpful term. So when we say you, you, have, you uh, embrace this identity, that's a bit more accurate. Like they are understanding that their behavior and their feelings are forming an identity. And, and really, truly, that's, that's some of those, those nuances in engaging in this conversation that we have to be really careful of. Also, I will say that as the church, can I encourage us when we're talking about people to not label them according to their sexual orientation? So please don't say of people, they are gay, they are bi, they are this. Because first off, the power of life and death is in the tongue. And when we're affirming identity over people, we are confirming a deception in their life. And so what I say and said, and I, and I know we get, I, I even am struggling to do this, but this is a conviction that I'm, I'm working on being more consistent with, is I try to say they identify as gay. They identify as transgender. Or, you know, somewhere along those lines, because what I don't want to do is agree with the deception and the lie. And not that this is, like, going to... God is not going to be... Ooh, there I am. <laughs> <laughs> not that God is going to be angry at you for doing this wrong, but I'm saying it's a better practice to say they identify as. Because if someone has decided they're identifying in a particular way, that's changeable. But saying you are gay is more permanent. That makes sense? So, okay. So that's the ones that I would like to leave you with on that one. Question. Yes. I missed, you said don't call it lifestyle. So what are you calling it today? Um, just that they identify as gay. Yeah. Or they are part of the gay community or something along those lines. Do we want to use this? That one does that again. Then I'll pick that up. Okay. You'll remind me. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> okay, so next question is, in your experience, you understood God's plan even though you struggled with it. And I'm dead. Okay. And I can it. I'm turning it off. on the microphone. Do, do, do. There we go. Okay. In my experience, you understood God's plan even though you struggled with it. How do we relate to those who don't know Scripture as a standard? Okay, what I would say to that is that first and foremost, their sexuality is not the first thing in God's priority list. Knowing Jesus is. And I think that one of the things, I, I will never forget a pastor that once said this. He said, you know, you can't clean a fish before you catch it. And we kind of get that, like, sanctification and salvation thing backwards sometimes. It's like we need to get them cleaned up and agreeing to all the standards before they come into the household of faith. It's like, I'm sorry, that's not true for any of us. We all are walking in different levels of conviction over things throughout our life because Jesus has a process for us of maturing. And he doesn't require us to agree with everything when we come into his family. He requires us just to come as we are. And so what I say is before we debate the scriptures— um, on homosexuality, what we need to do is introduce people to Jesus. And if they have legitimate questions about, like, well, what do you believe about homosexuality? Then we, then we very confidently and very um, plainly sell, tell, tell them what we believe. But it has to be balanced with this. Here are my convictions and what we believe. And equally, I believe I am called to love you and respect you. I'm called to love you as myself. 
I'm called to, to help you walk out your journey and, and learn more about Jesus. I'm called not to reject you. I'm called to value you as someone in the image of God. And so, yes, do I believe that this behavior is sinful? Yes, I do. But I also believe that that sin is no worse of a sin than my own. And I'm a sinner saved by grace, too. And so we, we level the playing field a bit. Um, God has to be the one to convict of sin. It's not our job. When we take on the, the job of the Holy Spirit, it never goes well. Because it turns into manipulation or control rather than the Spirit moving. And as we know from the Word of God, it's His kindness that leads people to repentance. And so that's the thing. If we, if we live out our lives in such a way, interacting with people, that the love of God permeates everything that we do, that is more compelling. And I'll tell you the truth. Every person I know that have had to come out of this particular lifestyle, every person, they don't come out because they've lost an argument. They come out because the love of God was so tangible in people that it proved better than the love they were getting somewhere else. You see, because here's the thing. I shared this morning, Proverbs 27, it says, To him who is well fed, honey is not desirable. But to him who is starving, the bitter thing will seem to taste sweet, right? And then I said, Taco Bell is the devil, and we all agreed. Sort of. Um, but if we focus, <laughs> yeah, sorry. If we focus on the first half of that scripture, to him who is well fed, honey is not desirable. If we meet the tangible needs in a, in a life giving and a God honoring way, it meets the needs. And then they're not starving anymore. Some of the greatest needs represented in the gay community are acceptance, love, touch. Do you know touch is a need? It is absolutely a need. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, you, exactly. And how many people did Jesus touch that were untouchable? And that touch healed them. I think of the woman who had been bleeding for, what, 20 some odd years, something like that. She was unclean according to standards, but she just touched his robe knowing that the touch of his robe was going to heal her. And, I mean, that, that is such a profound thing. When we engage relationally with people, we begin to meet the needs that are represented in their life. And God will tell us what they are, because we have them too. He'll just let us see where they are. And we present the truth, but we don't demand that they agree with it. We love them well then the Holy Spirit can move towards re in repentance. And people are way more likely to repent when they know they are safe. Let me, uh, let me ask you this. Let's, let's go to the story of the prodigal son real quick. So in the story of the prodigal son, how many of you remember the story of the prodigal? Okay. So when, when the son was in the pig's pen and he came to his senses, what did he say? I know that in my father's house, even the slaves are treated better than this. I will go back to my father's house and maybe he'll receive me as a slave. So there was something about the character of his father that he knew his father was good. And even in his despair, what he knew was, I will at least be accepted in as a slave because that is the character of my father. When the gay community recognizes that we, or even the gay individual recognizes, I love you and I demonstrate that love for you no matter what. You know I don't agree with you, but I've proven that I love you and that even though we don't agree, I value you and I treat you with respect. Where do you think they're going to go when, con when conviction hits? I'll go to him because I know he's always treated me with respect. I'll go to him because I always, I always knew he was a safe place. Let me tell you a quick story about that. It was a, years back, there was a mom and a young man that showed up at our ministry, and he was 19 years old. And he had, she had just brought him back home from college at Azusa Pacific where he had attempted to commit suicide because he had been in a gay relationship and the, the guy broke up with him and he felt like he didn't have anything to live for. So she dragged him into our office basically saying, fix him, you know, because she was terrified. She's a lovely woman. I absolutely lo adore her. But she was very concerned for her son and she was dragging him there to be fixed. And so we did what we commonly did. is said, you know, we separate the kid and the parent. And the parent goes over here with one staff member who's going to say, you can't do this. 
Like they have to want to be here in order for this to be effective. And then the other one will take the kid and say, are you okay? Do you want to be here? Like, can I, I'm sorry you got dragged here to be fixed, but you know, are you okay? And so one staff member took her and I sat with this young man and I said to him, do you want to be here? We said, no, I don't. I said, okay. And let me just say this. I'm so sorry that you are going through what you're going through. I can, uh, I, I can imagine and I can remember what rejection feels like. And even though maybe I don't agree that it was the right relationship for you, I certainly understand what loss feels like. And I'm so sorry you're going through this. And he just looked at me like, you're supposed to tell me I'm sinning, you know. And it doesn't matter that the relationship was sinful, it was a loss. And then I shared, and I understand what it feels like to be so desperate that you just want to take your life. Because I at one point was there. I said, I'm so sorry. I hope you know that whether or not you ever agree with what I believe, if you ever get into a place where you feel like you want to take your life, please call me. I said, okay. And I said, tell me about yourself. So he just sat and shared with me for a little bit. And after this long conversation, when his mom was finishing up in the other room, I said, you know what? I understand you're not at a place to give your life over to this right now. But if that ever changes, please know there's a safe place for you to come. And he said, okay, whatever. A year and a half later, I got a phone call from him. I can't do this anymore. This life is just ruining me. I think I'm ready to surrender my life to Jesus. Can you help me? Yes, I can. He came to our ministry. I ministered to him for years. Um, he, He, in his story has so much pain, so much pain and baggage, was sexually molested at the age of four by his uncle. By the time he was 19 years old to where he got to this point, there had been over 18 men that had, that had taken advantage of him. To say that he was broken and hurting and didn't know what love was, he never knew his biological father. The second man that was in his life as a stepfather, he thought was his real father. And then his mom divorced him, and he found out he wasn't his real father. And now he had a third stepfather who was a really good man, but he had closed his heart off to that man. You know, he had a lot of hurt. And I'll tell you that this young man's journey has been very, very difficult because he'll take two steps forward, and he'll take one step back. And he'll take two steps forward and one step back. And it doesn't matter how many times that young man has fallen down he has always come back to Jesus, and he has always sought to try and, and follow Jesus better the next time. And I've known this young man for now almost a decade. And what's heartbreaking is that in one of the last times that he fell down, he contracted HIV. But he got back up again, and he is continuing to give his life over to Jesus in a way in the last year that I have never seen in him, which is profound And I share that to say that, you know, when we are working with people that don't necessarily have the same standard, it doesn't mean they won't get there. We have to trust the Holy Spirit. And we have to be faithful to minister in the way that God puts in front of us to minister. And if that's simply to say, I'm going to be kind to you and not require anything of you. Or if it's to say, I'm going to empathize with you and try to remember what it felt like to be hopeless and meet them in that place. That speaks volumes. Because we have a God who did that for us. He came down in flesh and experienced humanity so that he could relate to us. I love that passage. We have a high priest who is familiar with our temptations, familiar with the struggle of what it is to be human because he put on flesh to experience it. And now we can go to him and he can say, I understand. That's powerful. And so I would say, relate on that level. If they don't agree with Scripture, we're working off two different dictionaries anyway. But one thing that's common and universal is human need and human brokenness. Relate there. Um, How do you answer homosexuals who say their desire is just the way God made them and not a reparative drive or resulting from rejection? This is really common. Um, First thing is that I generally don't tend to get into conversations about what the cause of homosexuality is with people that are not trying to walk out of it. And the reason why is because because it doesn't matter what we are inclined to do, 
Just because something is natural does not make it moral or right. So I know many people in our world who very naturally come across anger. They are naturally angry people. Or naturally, um, you know, oh, you two are so cute. You're like, what, you, me, him, huh, him? Well, how about this? Everyone in here should relate to this. Some people are just naturally selfish. <laughs> Anyone who's been married will know that we're all naturally selfish, but that doesn't mean that it's moral or right or godly. And so one of the, so I don't tend to debate someone in that position. I say, okay, regardless of whether or not you believe that this is inborn and in unchangeable and the way God made you, the first thing I had to contend against is that God does not intend brokenness. And he did not make us in a way that would then uh, set us up to struggle. So if we have to remember that we are designed for perfect relationship with him, we have to go back to the garden and understand how we were made there, not how we are now. Because we're imperfect now, but Adam and Eve were, were designed, and humanity was designed for perfect communion and relationship with God. Which also means that rejection is not natural to the human. We're not built for rejection. So y'all know what it feels like when you're picked last for gym. Some of you can remember that, right? Or pick last for something or feel like exposed for not being good enough. You know that feeling of like heat that comes out from underneath your collar and you like you turn red and everything's awful? How many of you can relate to that feeling? Raise your hand if you can relate to that feeling. This is participation time. Okay. And one of the reasons why we have that biological, physiological response is because we were not made for that. It is an actual reaction where rejection and, and um, abuse and pain, all these things are unnatural to us in our design. And so we respond viscerally to it. And so, you know, we can, I, I then tend to go to that kind of conversation of like God did not build us in any way to be outside of his will, but we all kind of are. We're all broken. And so even if your your brokenness like tends to lead you to selfishness or anger or or promiscuity or homosexuality or whatever, and I can make good arguments for the fact that that's not actually biologically the case, but if maybe spiritually we're bent towards rebellion, it does not make it right and it does not make it permissible even if it feels natural. And so that's where I start with that conversation is before we ever get to what you believe got you there, you're there, and now what? The Word of God calls us to obedience regardless of how we feel about what we're tempted towards. And so if we can agree on that, then we can have a place to go with what really causes this, and God can begin to illuminate that. But someone in this position might be in rejection of that statement too, that God calls us beyond that, which is a different thing that we have to wrestle with. Um, but I don't generally try to, to explain to someone who is resistant to looking for a root cause because maybe they're not ready to face it. Now, you can look at people, prominent people in the gay community in culture. Like one person in particular I think of is Ellen DeGeneres. I really want her saved. I like her so much. I And I want to be on her show when she's giving away stuff. Like, I just want the, I want the swag. But I, I think she's a really sweet person, and I think that she's a really funny person, and a lot of God's heart comes out of her. Because if you really see in, in what her motivations are, you see that there's a lot of what God put in her, in the design in her from the beginning. Even if she's in rebellion, she's still built in God's image, and she has no help but to reflect him somehow. But one of the saddest things for me in listening to her story is she was sexually molested by her father. And she will straight up tell you that had nothing to do with my lesbianism. Well, I'm sorry, but 85% of the women that I've ministered to in my history have been sexually molested. And I know what that does to a person's heart. I know from hundreds of women the things that Satan speaks to our hearts about, particularly for women, what it tells you about your femininity when you're molested. It says that femininity makes you vulnerable and weak. It says that femininity makes you a target. It says that your femininity was the cause or the catalyst to your abuse. And for a lot of lesbian women, you cast off your femininity because your femininity made you unsafe. And yet there is such a reluctance to put a cause that is wound behind identity that you're finding affirmation in. 
Because again, can you imagine everything that Ellen would stand to lose if she were to admit that her brokenness is making her lesbian rather than saying this is just who she is? Make sense? So I don't debate the cause with someone who's not being compelled to wrestle through what the cause is. I, I talk on terms of where is your conviction about your behavior and what does God call us to? Because that's one of the first conversations we need to have. What is God calling us to? And no matter what you feel, if you believe God is calling you to obedience, then your feelings have to take back seat to the obedience. And that's really the first place a lot of us start, is we don't feel before we obey, right? Like, I'll tell you what, I know God is telling me that I need to lose a little weight and be a little bit healthier because I'm getting older, and I want to be a little bit more intimidating looking when my girls hit full puberty because I want to scare some people with the way I look. This is not scary. I also feel convicted that I need to be a better steward of this. Well, if I'm waiting for my feelings to get on board with working out, it ain't never going to happen. Because I'll tell you what my feeling is when I get to work out, I feel like I want to throw up. And that is not motivating to me. I have to obey and step into that before my feelings ever follow because the Word of God says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful. That's the same thing with this. I don't. The debate of what caused it is not as important as what are you going to do now? It's here. It's a reality. Now what? That makes sense? And we can talk till the day... Um, till the day is done and the cows come home about what causes homosexuality. And again, there's not a formula because every person is different. But there are common themes of brokenness, of need, of exposure and defilement. There's culture. There's, I mean, there's a whole teaching I could do on that maybe another time, my second visit. So, um, but is that, is that helpful? Yeah? Okay, what if a person is actively in a sinful homosexual relationship and refuses to repent or let the relationship go? After you sh uh, shared the gospel, doesn't 1 Corinthians 5 say to throw them out uh, so that their souls will be saved? In your testimony, it sounded like you had repented. Okay, so there's that scripture that says, you know, hand the sinner over to Satan so that their soul may be, you know, they, their body may be destroyed, but their soul may be saved. Okay, well... Again, what kind of person are we talking about? Are we talking about a person in the church? Are we talking about a person who claims the name of Jesus? Are we talking about someone who's involved in leadership? Are we talking about just someone who's a casual acquaintance? There's so many nuances that go into this. There's so many things to consider culturally and historically about what Paul was addressing in 1 Corinthians that some things don't translate well to our culture here and now. For example, the, 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 the first century church having everything in common, facing a, a reality that their lives may be at stake for their very faith, huddling together and being a very tight-knit community. When someone's sexually sinning in that community, it's a lot different than someone that shows up on Sunday. You know, it's a different reality. Um, you know, if I were to say, you know, I, I, I have to deal with this in relation to, to my twin brother, do I throw him out of relationship or do I preserve relationship? And Paul even says, that, you know, when he says, you know, with a brother who, who claims the name of Christ is, but sexually immoral, don't even eat with such a man, does that mean lunch or does that mean communion? You know, we have to wrestle through the meanings of these things because to eat with someone was a different connotation in the first century than it is now. But he then follows it up as like, I'm not talking about the world. If I was talking about the world, you'd have to leave this world because, wow, that's the Drew translation of the scripture. We are, we are always going to be interacting with the unsaved world and the re rebellious world. We have to. What we classify in relationship of what we have fellowship with people or we remove people from fellowship of the faith. And that might mean if someone is coming here and they are unrepentant and they are, you know, living in unrepentant sin, but they're still coming to your church. Well, how many people does that describe in most of our churches? We'd be throwing everybody out. You know, like, well, you haven't given out pornography yet, so out you go. It's like, and there's a difference between unrepentant and struggling, embracing and practicing as a, as a endorsed and a celebrated lifestyle versus I keep falling down and I don't want to. Does that make sense? So the difference between someone who's using pornography and says, this is God's best and his will for me and I love it and it's uh, awesome and amazing versus the person who's struggling every night and says, I hate this about myself, but I don't know how to get out of it. There's a difference there. 
And so there's so much that we have to wrestle through in this. Does there come a time where we break relationship from people? Yes. There does come a time where we break certain types of relationship with people. When we have people who are professing the name of Jesus and they are in our congregations and they're people of influence and they are leading others astray, there comes a point where we have to say, you're disobedient to the Lord and we have to remove you from this fellowship because we can't allow your influence here. But that's very different from the casual person who comes in. Does that make sense? The relational weight and the relational um, level dictates how we respond to people. My coworker, if they're, you know, said, well, I was a Christian once and now I'm in a gay life and this is, this is great. Well, I don't get to cast you out. I don't be gone so Satan must sift you. No, I, I just, I'm actually called to be present in your life, to be that holy annoyance to you, to be that, that voice of truth. Because again, there's not going to be other voices of truth. There's just going to be a lot of voices that confirm their life. I want to be that irritation that keeps confronting you. I, I find this wonderful and beneficial in my relationship with my brother. You know, we don't have Christian fellowship with him, but we have relationship. So one day what that looked like was they were over for dinner with us one night, and we were going to watch The Amazing Race because that's something we can relate to on them because otherwise we just stare at each other. You know, it was a rough season in that relationship. We were we were kind of grieving that he was actually moving forward in this relationship. We needed something to distract us and keep the lines of communication open. So, amazing race it was. And one day he said, we should be on there. It would make great television. I'm like, identical twin brother. One who has left a gay lifestyle and now preaches across the country. Another who embraces it. That would be interesting television, wouldn't it? <laughs> I don't think I'd come off well in that. Um but we were there, and they were going to their gay church at the time. Literally, the gay denomination, uh, the Metropolitan Community Church, whole denomination based on homosexuality. And they were at our house, and his partner got a phone call from a friend from the church because they were hosting a goodbye party for their pastor because he was moving on from Portland to Colorado, and they were going to throw him the pastoral goodbye. Okay. As we're sitting there, my brother's partner turns to him and says, well, you know, so-and-so would like to know when the stripper should show up. Now, let me tell you this. One of my brother's arguments for me about the morality of his choices were that his community was just as moral and exactly the same as mine. They were just homosexual. Really? So I sat there and I watched this uncomfortable interaction in my home, which I got the privilege of seeing because I'm relational with them and I invite them into relationship with me and I have not thrown them away. And I watched my brother uncomfortably squirm as his partner, who did not have any conviction over this at all, was asking him when the stripper should show up for the pastor goodbye party at their home. And I'm sitting there like this. <laughs> and I'm thinking in my head, oh, Holy Spirit, what do I say? What do I say? And, and the Holy Spirit is like, just wait, just wait, just wait. And I'm sitting there, and they have this little interaction, and, and they stop talking, and everything's really quiet and awkward. And it's like this long silence. And the Holy Spirit was like, now. And I go, I'm confused. <laughs> and my brother looked at me and goes, what? And I said, well, in my world, when I think pastoral goodbye, potluck is what comes to mind. <laughs> Not stripper pole. And they're both just looking at me, and they, they have no defense, none whatsoever. And I look at them, and I said, can you please help me understand why that is appropriate for a Christian community? And he just looked at me, and he said, no, I can't. And I said, okay. Just needed to ask. And the Holy Spirit said, you're done. And I said, okay, all right back to Amazing Race. <laughs> and it was so, I know he knows. I know he knows. And so I'm just like, you just have to sit with that. You have to sit with that. So then uh, several months later, and I'll tell you, this particular pastor proved to be so useful to us in providing examples 
to reflect back the incongruity of my brother's community and what they claim to believe. Because we were once again watching Amazing Race months later when this pastor actually called during the taping of the sh like during the show airing to my brother at our house to brag that he had had a one night stand with one of the people on the show. And my brother and his partner are listening to this phone conversation right in my home. And I'm doing once again this. And the Holy Spirit is wait, wait, wait. They get off the phone, dead silence and uncomfortability. And then the Holy Spirit said, go. And I said, I'm confused again. <laughs> and he said, what? And I said, never in all my life. Would a pastor ever call me to brag about a one-night stand? Can you please help me understand how that man is a spiritual leader? No, I can't. Okay. Just needed to ask. And the Holy Spirit said, stop. Now, I'll tell you the truth that there are times in our relationship where I have to be much more confrontational and I have to be much more direct about things. There are times where we have had these direct conversations like a time he was sitting with me and he does not enjoy and he really hates what I do. Like ideologically, they fully disagree with me. I remember one day my, my brother's partner said to me, I wish you'd just go be a pastor somewhere. I said, oh, really? You do? It's like, yeah, I wish you'd just stop doing what you're doing and go be a pastor some more. I said, so you'd like me to have a bigger platform than just this small little ministry here in Portland? Because, Will, wherever I go, my testimony is still my testimony. So do you want me to have a bigger platform to do this or just a small little ministry I'm a part of here? Well, crap, he says. And I'm like, <laughs> I am who I am, Will. Like, he's like, uh, uh. Well, so one day we were having this conversation. He's like, my brother was saying to me, well, you know, the difference between the two of us is I believe you're going to heaven and I believe I'm going to heaven and you believe you're going to heaven and you believe I'm going to hell. You know, because First Corinthians says, the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God, blah, 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 blah. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? You're a little bit wrong in that. You see, I don't have the authority to say who's going to hell. I said, that is way above my pay grade. I don't want that job. I'd be on the freeway. A lot of people would be going to hell all the time. <laughs> I lived in Portland. Rush hour is always. Like, it's not a happy place. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. I am not, I'm not the person to hold that job. So I said, I don't have the authority to say who's going to heaven, who's going to hell. I do have the authority to say this. Or, or the, com the, the conviction to say this. I can't tell you that you're going to hell because I don't know where God's grace begins and ends with this stuff. I don't know your journey. I don't know. I don't know where you're at with the Lord. I said, but what grieves my heart is I don't have the joy of assuring you that you are going to heaven because the word of God clearly says that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't know the end of your story. I don't know the long rope of the grace of God for you. But I also don't have the joy of assuring you. I do have the joy of, of being assured myself because there's nowhere in the scripture that I am actively embracing and practicing something the Bible calls sin. He says, well, you're a glutton. I said, no, I'm fat. I'm not a glutton. I overeat sometimes or I eat fast food. Taco Bell, I talked all about it today. Sometimes I only eat one meal a day because I'm so busy raising kids and doing ministry that I forget to eat. So my metabolism is slow as a sloth. That's my problem. I said, but even gluttony, I would have to be practicing it and proclaiming it as God's best. And I know full well Taco Bell ain't God's best. <laughs> I'm repentant every time. Can you say the same about gay sex? No. Then don't point out something I rightly call dysfunction and sin, comparing it to something you call God's best. That's not an effective argument, and it's bad logic. He's like, well, crap. I was like, yeah. 
I said, so I don't get to tell you you're going to hell, but I can't assure you you're going to heaven. And so we have those painful conversations. We have the awkward conversations of like, you know, they come to visit us in Medford. They live in Portland. Do we let them stay in our home? Yes, we do. Do we let them share a bedroom? We do. Do we say to them, don't you dare have sex in our house? We do. Because I'm sitting in a bed together, laying in a bed together. They've been together 10 years. They don't have sex anymore. That was kind of a joke. <laughs> Thank you. And also, here's, here's the conundrum of that, because this is a question that normally comes up, which didn't get asked, but I'll answer it anyway, because now you're thinking about it. A lot of people suggest, like, if, they are, if your loved one is coming for a holiday, and you're like, well, I can't allow sin in my home, so I'm going to get a, them a hotel room, because I don't want to allow this sinful expression in my home. My question for you rhetorically is, where is a couple more likely to have sex? In a hotel room or in a bedroom that shares a wall with you? Essentially what we do when we say, I'm going to get you a hotel room, is we're saying, you go take your sin somewhere, I can't see it. Rather than having the hard conversation that says, I love you, I want relationship with you, and I have standards for my home. So here's my standards. Can you abide by them, or do you have to get a hotel room? Here's, here's something to say about that. When we are engaging with people um, who are actively involved in sin, whether it be homosexuality, whether it be transgender issues, whether it be whatever it is, we are called to relate to them. We are called to engage with them. We never are called to violate our convictions, but we are called to violate our own comfort. And sometimes those two are a little fuzzy for people because what makes us uncomfortable isn't necessarily a conviction. It's just uncomfortable. And sometimes we parade around the uncomfortability as if it's a conviction from the Holy Spirit and we're deceiving ourselves or we're actively ignoring the fact that this is not actually conviction. This is just super uncomfortable for me. And we have a lot more permission to engage relationally and, and interactively if we acknowledge things are uncomfortable and really debate and, and fight for what the conviction is. Because the thing is, is having my brother and his partner in my home is, is uncomfortable at times. But if I say to them, don't engage in sex in my house, I have laid out a standard for them. And if they cannot abide by that, they, they can either have enough respect for me to tell me that or enough respect for me to abide by it. And even if they don't, am I guilty of the thing I've asked them not to do? No. If I know they're doing it and I can continue to enable them to do it, then am I sort of guilty? Yeah, I'd be the same thing of with, I have, t you know, future teenagers and internet pornography is an issue. I can say to them, here's a computer and has internet access. Do not violate the standards of use for this computer. Do not look at pornography. I might put some safeguards on there, but kids are geniuses and they know how to get around stuff all the time. If they disobey and transgress that rule, am I guilty for that sin for them? Have I enabled them to that sin? No, I've set a standard for them. Do if I then know that they're doing it and do nothing, am I guilty? Yes, I am. And so it might be uncomfortable to say, come in our home, stay in our home, but here's my standard. Do not engage in sexual behavior and do not be overly affectionate in front of my kids because it's my responsibility to teach them, not you. That's an uncomfortable conversation, but I'll have it. And then I'll have them in my home. And you know what? It was only uncomfortable the first couple times we had to have the conversation. Now they know the rules. And they abide by them when they relate with us. And it's important for us to relate to them. It is absolutely important for us to relate to them. Now, if I were to say, you go take your sin where I can't see it and I'll pay for the hotel room, what is that communicating to them? I don't care if you sin, just don't do it in front of me. That's not the heart of God. That's not relational health. And so when I say that, I, I don't say this as go and do likewise. I say interact with the Holy Spirit on how you might have to handle some of these interactions because this is how the Lord has led me. But we have a lot of freedom to know what our conviction should be and what our comfort level is. Make sense? Okay. So. The next question was, God has done so much for me, even spared my life, but I do struggle with God loving me. All my life, I was told I'm not wanted as a child. Then two 
failed marriages. They wanted someone better. Um, I am so sorry this has been your experience, and I certainly understand what it is to not feel loved by God. And I think that one of the things that was pivotal for me in understanding that God loved me, there's a few things. One is being vulnerable with his people about what I'm dealing with. Because, you know, the, the devil told me the lie that if they really knew what I was struggling with, then they would not want me or they would not love me or they would reject me. And that was only proven to be untrue until I was honest. And when I let all my cards be shown and then I, sh- it, it proved that they loved, people loved me any- anyway, and they still wanted me a part of their life. We don't overcome lies without exposing them to the light. And so if you believe you're unloved and if you believe God doesn't love you or if you feel that way, you have to begin talking about it so that God can begin to confront that lie. And you have to do that with people that are the hands and feet of Jesus so that the Jesus incarnate in his body can love you actively. And the other thing that you need to do is we, what I had to do is I had to believe and quote and live and and declare the scriptures about his love for me every time I didn't feel lovable. Because even though that incredible interaction with James and Amy was a, a catalyst moment for me about understanding the love of God, it was like a conception of that was, was, was um, occurred in my life, much like a pregnancy, but that didn't mean it was fully mature, and that didn't mean that it was even birthed out into new life yet. It was, it was a, something that happened, and it needed to be nurtured and cultivated. I can tell you now that I am confident in God's love for me, but for a lot of years I battled back and forth on that. And God had to prove himself over and over to me, not because I, I demanded it, but because there was a lot of wound there that needed to be undone, and God was faithful to do it. And so I would say that you declare his goodness over you, you're honest with your struggles that, that have informed it, and, and here's one other thing I will say. This is a recent thing in my life. I'm on staff at Living Waters Church here in town, and we have a great staff. And sometimes with a big team and a lot of staff, you kind of run into relational things because we're all human, and our humanity kind of steps on each other once in a while. And in my previous work environments, there was a little bit of dysfunction with some of the ways that my boss related to me as far as like um, – you know, we were a small staff and in ministry, sometimes your needs get overlooked. Like if you want to take a day off, you're kind of like, but the Lord's work is here and you don't really get a Sabbath. And anyway, I was, it was a long explanation to say that I was not accustomed to just being able to receive the fact that people cared about me and my needs. Um, and so I kind of approached some relationship in my new staff here in Medford with kind of like this, I need to defend myself for a need, which isn't what we need to do. Like we don't really need to do that. And I found myself doing that, and, and the staff was so gracious to be like, you don't have to defend yourself for a day off. Like, you work really hard, and probably a lot harder than some of us sometimes, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I do. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but they were like, you really don't have to do that. That's not true here. And one staff member in particular said, well, that's not the truth. And I know what she was saying. She was confronting the lie that Satan, like, had sold me, But one of the reasons why that lie had power is because it was true for a number of years. I did have to defend myself. People weren't interacting lovingly or kindly to me. They were making me defend my needs. And so it was true for like 30 some odd years of my life. And so we began interacting. I said, you know what? I recognize that it's not true now, but it was true for a long time. That lie found its place somewhere. And I have to be in agreement with the fact that now the reality has changed, but that doesn't mean I don't remember the pain of when it was true. That makes sense? So, like, I have this scar on my hand right here, and it is a scar. I'd like to say there was something manly that happened. It wasn't. I stabbed myself making guacamole, which is really dumb because I know how to make good guacamole, and I know how to handle avocados. But I just so happened to be at one of my parents' house, and they don't have the right knife, and I was using a dull steak knife. And instead of doing it the way I know to do it, I was like, hmm, I'm going to stab this pit like this and try to pull it out of the avocado. That's not smart. And three avocados in, the Holy Spirit said, you need to knock this off. You're going to hurt yourself. And I said, oh, I've gotten two down. I've got, I'm on my third. It's fine. And the Holy Spirit once again said, you need to stop. You're going to hurt yourself. And I said, no, I'm fine. And then the knife slipped, and I stabbed my hand an inch deep. 
And I, you know, slightly panicked when I saw the bone in the tendon and I looked at my hand and it was bleeding and I was looking at the avocado and I was like, I stabbed myself. And I just kept repeating it. Getting higher and higher in pitch every time. So it started with, I stabbed myself. I stabbed myself. I stabbed myself, you know, I was like, and higher and higher. And my wife came running in and she's like, okay. <laughs> you know? And off to the hospital we went and got stitches and couldn't move my finger for months and it was really painful. It's all healed. It's fine. There's a scar. I have function. Everything's good. But I'll tell you what, anytime I pick up an avocado, I'm like, oh, <laughs> careful, you know, and I can feel feel my arm hurting and I can like I, I feel it in my body because my muscle memory remembers the pain of a wound that isn't still a wound but it was at one time and I can tell you spiritually if it's true for the body it's true for the soul because if we've experienced wounds in the body and we have that memory of it the soul works very similarly if something reminds us of a pain that we had once upon a time it doesn't mean we're still wounded but we certainly can remember the pain and I would say that if you're struggling to know that God loves you, there's a reason why. There's a reason why that's a struggle for you. And you don't have to apologize for it. But what we do have to remember is that's not true. And we need to repeat the truth over us, even if it doesn't feel like it's truth. And we need to walk in the truth, even if it doesn't feel like it's true. And we need to make ourselves vulnerable before people that can confirm the fact that God loves us, and that's what we need to do. We don't heal outside of relationship. Relational wounds require relational healing. Amen? I'm so far probably over the time we thought I was going to be here, but I'm going to risk it and say, are there any other questions? <laughs> really, you're all taking the risk if you ask, so. <laughs> really? No other questions? Not for now. Maybe the second visit. Notice how I keep on suggesting this. <laughs> We're putting a comma instead of a period on this conversation uh, to be continued, really. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Let me, let me pray for us, and then we can kind of call it a night. Lord God, thank you for your sons and daughters in this room. Thank you for the fact that they care to know and to understand this issue.